Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and call the post audit uh, committee to order uh, Friday, April 22nd. Um, just want to remind everybody we are live streaming to turn on and use your mics. Uh, also, turn in your travel vouchers. Um, we'll go ahead and, and move on to the Kansas driver's license suspension process. The uh, first part of it, the financial aspect, uh, Kib. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. So I'm here to present actually two limited scope audits. These were the two driver's license audits that were approved in May of 2021. Um, for simplicity's sake, we've combined them into one report, which is what I'm gonna present today. And the audit manager for these audits was Matt Etzel. So there were two questions for this audit report, uh, one from each of the two limited scopes. I'm gonna go over those questions and their short answers quickly, and then we'll get into some details. So the first question was, what are the financial aspects of Kansas's process for suspended and revoked licenses? And we found that from 2019 to 2021, Kansas drivers paid about $18 million in fees to have their driver's license reinstated. And um, we'll get into that, the details of that shortly. The, the second question was, what's the impact of Kansas's process for suspended and revoked driver's licenses on Kansas drivers? And we found that it's possible that some Kansas drivers experienced financial or social hardship um, from their suspension or revocation, but recently proposed changes to state law could uh, reduce those impacts in certain cases. So I'm going to start on page three with some overview information and cover some definitions. So the Division of Vehicles is responsible for um, administering state law pertaining to driver's licenses. And the division operates a program called Driver Solutions. And it's this program that works with uh, driver's license suspensions, revocations, and reinstatements. Um, there are statutory definitions for suspensions and revocations, but these terms can be used somewhat interchangeably. So I'm going to instead explain the sort of the real practical differences between different types of suspensions and revocations. Um, there are basically two types. The first type is a suspension or revocation with a predefined time frame. In those cases, generally, the driver just waits out that time frame before being automatically reinstated. Um, and this can include both suspensions and revocations. The second type is an indefinite suspension, and this type lasts until the driver fulfills some criteria and in some cases pays fees. Now, depending on the specific process of the violation, a license reinstatement can either mean that the driver has obtained their full driving privileges again, um, or that they have been granted restricted driving privileges. So I'm turning to page four now. Um, like I said, drivers must fulfill violation-specific criteria to have their license reinstated. And the top of page four lists the three most common license suspensions. And for each, there's a description of the specific reinstatement process for those violations. I just want to highlight these three real quick. So the first one that you see there is a failure to comply suspension. Um, this kind of suspension is indefinite. It's given to drivers who fail to pay a traffic citation on time or appear in court in compliance with a traffic citation. You can also see that there are suspensions for DUI related violations, um, which you can see there. And those suspensions, those are the type that last a predefined time frame. And then lastly, there you see suspensions for driving without insurance. Um, and you can see you can read more details there on page four. There are also many other violations that can lead to a license suspension or revocation, but those are generally less common. Um, so bottom of page four, we'll turn to some of the financial aspects and our findings relating to that. So we analyzed fee collection data by the, uh, provided by the Division of Vehicles. And in total, we found that from 2019 to 2021, which is the time frame that we looked at for this audit, we found that uh, Kansas drivers paid about $18 million in reinstatement fees. Now, there are several different kinds of reinstatement fees, fees for different violations. So if you turn to the middle of page five, you can see figure one there. Figure one shows the eight different kinds of reinstatement fees that drivers paid or could have paid over the last three years. 
Uh, I just want to highlight the failure to comply fee, which is there at the top. Um, so this is the fee that drivers who have been suspended for failure to comply with citation. It's the fee that they have to pay to get reinstated. And you'll notice that this fee alone amounted to about $9 million, which is almost half of all the reinstatement fee revenue. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly note that a couple of the fee totals uh, in this figure have been estimated. And if you want to read more about that, you can read our methodology on the top of page five. Now, this $18 million that was collected, um, it was allocated to several different uh, state funds and programs. Most of the fee revenue for reinstatement fees is remitted to the state treasurer, who's then responsible for making the allocations. Um, and you can read some examples of how those fees are broken down at the page, bottom of page five. So on page six now, um, you can uh, see figure two right in the middle of the page. That uh, figure shows all of those allocations broken down by the fund or program and then how much each received. I'm not going to cover this for the sake of time, but if you're interested in the allocations and their amounts, you can refer to that, that figure. Um, additionally, we asked the Division of Vehicles how much it costs to operate the Driver Solutions Program. And they estimated that it costs about $2.4 million per year. Um, and that includes expenses for staff salaries, supplies, uh, postage for mailing suspension notices. Um, so that covers the financial side of things. We'll move to the top of page seven. Um, we'll start looking at some of the impacts. So like I mentioned at the very beginning, um, the short answer here is that it's possible some Kansas drivers experienced financial and social hardships from their suspension or revocation, but recent changes to state law may reduce those impacts in some cases. So for this part, we analyzed suspension and revocation data provided by the Division of Vehicles. Um, this included individual records of suspensions, revocations, and reinstatement dates if they had one. Um, we found that from 2019 to 2021, the Division of Vehicles issued about 176,000 uh, suspensions or revocations. Um, there's some more discussion about our methodology and some demographic information presented on page seven. So if you're interested, you can read that. But I'm going to turn to the top of page eight and we'll look at figure three, which is right there at the top. So this figure shows a breakdown of all suspensions and revocations by the violation category. And you can see that from 2019 to 2021, of that 176,000 suspensions or revocations, the vast majority of them, over half, were uh, for failure to comply with citation. And you can also note that the top two categories there, failure to comply and driving without insurance, uh, those are the indefinite suspensions. Next, we, we analyzed rates of reinstatement by those different violation categories. Um, so with, for violations with predefined timeframes, things like DUI, reckless driving, habitual violations, uh, those are generally the high-risk offenses. Um, we found that drivers who were suspended for those offenses um, had a 99% reinstatement rate. And that means that almost all of them were reinstated at the end of that predefined time frame. And this is kind of what you'd expect since generally all the driver has to do is just wait out that time frame before being automatically reinstated. And now turning to uh, page nine, you can contrast that rate with the rates of reinstatement for uh, those indefinite suspensions, things like failure to comply and driving without insurance, these are generally the lower risk violations, and they usually require the driver to fulfill criteria and in some cases pay fees before being reinstated. And we found that for these kinds of violations, the rate of reinstatement after one year was only 40%. And if you look at figure four at the bottom of the page, you can see a breakdown of the reinstatement rates by different violations. And you can see in that figure that the failure to comply violation had the lowest rates of reinstatement. So even after three years, a little less than half uh, of those had been reinstated. And the rates were similar, but a little bit higher for the other kind of kinds of violations shown there. Now, you can see the trend in that figure. So the bulk of drivers who get reinstated from these kinds of indefinite suspensions, they get reinstated within the first six months, which you can see. After that, the likelihood of them being reinstated drops fairly significantly. And this figure and these results suggest that um, drivers who are able to fulfill the criteria and pay the fees for these violations, um, they're generally the ones who may be reinstated quicker within that six-month time frame. However, 
it appears that there are some drivers who may be unable to fulfill those criteria and pay those fees. And those could be the ones that we see taking years to be reinstated or not being reinstated at all. So turning to page 10 now, um, as part of this work, we also conducted a literature review and we found eight studies that evaluated the effects of loss of driving privileges. Um, you can read more details here in this section, but generally the studies found that the loss of driving privileges can have negative financial and social impacts on some drivers. And at the bottom of page 10, you'll find a list of some recent legislation and pending legislation uh, pertaining to driver's license suspensions and revocations. So you can read about a couple pending bills there, but I wanted to highlight Senate Bill 127. Uh, at the very bottom of the page, this bill was passed in 2021, and it made a few changes to the reinstatement process uh, for failure to comply violations. So first, it removed a $25 fee that drivers used to have to pay to apply for restricted driving privileges. Um, it also eliminated an additional suspension for driving while suspended for a failure to comply violation. So again, both of these changes took effect very recently in the middle of 2021. Lastly, I'm going to turn to the middle of page 11. Um, so we interviewed a couple stakeholders concerning the impacts of driver's license suspensions and revocations in Kansas. I'm not going to go too much into detail here, but generally these two stakeholders agreed that driver's license suspensions and revocations can have unintended impacts on Kansans in some cases. And like I said, you can read more information from those interviews in this section. So that concludes the main findings of this report. Um, we didn't make any recommendations, but real quick, if you look on page 12, um, there's a potential issue for further consideration here that relates to the statutory definitions of suspensions and revocations, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so again, there are some ambiguities as to what practical differences actually exist between a suspension and revocation. Currently, revocations are treated basically the same as a suspension with a predefined time frame. Um, and this, the statutory definitions appear to draw a distinction between these two, suspensions and revocations, um, but that distinction doesn't really exist in practice. So with that, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Questions? Uh, Representative Barker? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good report. Thank you. Uh, you indicated it may have some impact, economic impact on the individual. Did you also look at, or apparently you didn't, the impact it would have on cities, city courts, uh, district courts? Uh, because if you don't have some penalty for failure to comply, no one will ever pay a traffic ticket. And they will continue to get them. I mean, there has to be a penalty involved. And the penalty presently is if you, you like the court gives you an, a period of time to pay your fines and costs, you can always come back in and ask for an extension. But after a period of time, they're going to send a letter to the driver's license bureau to suspend your driving privileges. Uh, and it bothers me that, you know, first time uh, a violation of 8-1567, driving while suspended, first time the minimum fines $100, five days in jail suspended. A second offense, you have to spend the five days in jail. Uh, so how many of those do you give that they don't have to pay any fines or any costs and maybe not serve any jail time? I mean, I, I, I see from your perspective and, and the audits was looking at the impact on the individual, but I also have to look at the impact that would have on the, the court system and, and, and law enforcement in general, because if we're not going to penalize anybody for not paying the traffic tickets or having a, uh, violation, of DUI 8-1567. Uh, then he can have four or five of them and never pay any fines, never have to pay any penalties. Uh, and so, I, Mr. Chairman, my, my thing is uh, we've, lo we've looked at one perspective, how it impacts the driver, and it, may, it does hurt people to have to pay fines and pay, pay reinstatement fees. I think the approach would be maybe to reduce the reinstatement fees, the, the, the cost of that, because... I think the reinstatement fees are about $100, $150 now that the Driver's License Bureau charges. But still uh, enforce the aspect of they've got to pay their fines because, you know, they committed the offenses. They were found guilty of it. Uh, and there must be a penalty. And the, the way we get 
people to comply with that is to drive, suspend their driving privileges. And, and then, of course, if they get caught after that, then they're driving while suspended, which is a more, more se a severe penalty. So uh, I like the report. I think it, it brings to light that maybe we should look at reinstatement fees, but the penalties should always be imposed. Uh, I mean, the effects on municipal courts, uh, you know, uh, how do they get people to come in and pay their fines without some stick? Thank I you. agree. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ware. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and while I absolutely agree that, you know, if, if a law is broken, we need to have some, some kind of repercussions, I think we need to really look clearly at what these levels of, and I agree that perhaps reducing, making it a little more less onerous, because I can't even tell you how many stories of my constituents that have ha been just, they, their life has been made impossible. For what started out to be one simple traffic ticket and then it cascaded, and then it's a slippery slope, and then it's more and more. And for what started with one traffic ticket ends up with a, a big jail time, not little jail time, big jail time, thousands of dollars, because it compounds and compounds. And, and it's because they don't have, they're living in poverty. They don't have the ability. It, perhaps if we reduced it enough, then they would, uh, it, it's it's a very complex issue. It is not cut and dried. It is not simple. And if if so, the the person who lives in poverty can't pay that that thing, that that fine. They still have a job. They still need to get to work. How do they do that without breaking the law? Do we want them to not work after they get a traffic ticket? I don't think so. So it's, it's far from being simple. I think there's a lot to look at here. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, and and I, I agree. Uh, but once you get notified by the driver's license bureau that your driver's license is suspended, uh, and you're correct, they have a job, they get up and they go to work. Uh, they make a poor decision because then they get driving and then they probably uh, commit another traffic infraction get stopped and suddenly the, the officer looks at it and says, you're driving while suspended. So that's a class B misdemeanor. This, this is something you're going to have to go to jail for and bond out on. Uh, but I'm not sure how we fix that. Senator uh, Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think what shocked me is the, the numbers that over 70% is uh, for failure to comply. Now, I, I don't know if this was looked at in the audit or not, but it was kind of curious. Um, are these multiple offenders where they got it suspended, got it reinstated, got it suspended again, reinstated? And if that's the case, I could see maybe a, grady, a gradient to where, you know, okay, first time is suspended, reinstatement cost is lower. Second time, you know, you, you go through the whole process because failure to comply is just thumbing your nose at the system and not recognizing that you've got a duty to, you know, prove that you're a safe driver uh, and that you're going to you know, follow the law. And I understand the, the situation with people who have difficulty doing that. And maybe we need to you know, be able to work with the first time offenders as long as they understand they need to comply. Because 70% of this is about compliance. I mean, DUI is way down the list. Uh, so that's just my comment on that. Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question. Thank you for your presentation. On the last page, it's on. Thank you. Um, on the last page, or page 12, it says potential issues for further consideration. I find it interesting that the terminology is... Um, contradictory or not consistent? And is that a matter to be addressed in statute? It sounds like the statutes are clear that they're choosing to interpret it differently or, or what is the case here? Um, so if there are statutory definitions for a suspension and revocation and those definitions are different, um, 
the suspension it defines it as basically a temporary removal of driving privileges for the revocation it's defined as the termination of driving privileges without the possibility of restoration so those two definitions appear different and they appear like they may be different but in practice the revocations the division of vehicles told us that the revocations operate the same as suspensions with predefined time frames so if you get a suspension with a predefined time frame, you wait out the period, you get reinstated generally automatically, and a revocation would operate just like that as well. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Chairman. So my concern is that we've written this, the statutes have been written by previous legislatures, and the Department of Revenue is choosing not to enforce the statute or to interpret it as written. The question. Um, so I can't really speak to the policy side of things or necessarily how to interpret it. Um, the Division of Vehicles just told us that this is the case now. Um, we asked uh, about the history of these statutes and we couldn't really get a clear answer. So it's possible that over time, maybe these definitions have sort of, you know, been watered down or um, something. But uh, beyond that, I can't really speak to what's intended. Officials from the Department of Revenue are here, so you'll be able to ask some questions. That'd be fine, Mr. Chairman, because my concern is the statutes exist. Who's watering it down? The legislature obviously hasn't changed it, so thank you. And I don't want to shoot the messenger. I appreciate the report, so thank you very much. Nope. Okay. Other questions? Um, we've Okay, we do have someone from the Department of Revenue. Oh, are they online? Um, go ahead, Senator Tyson. You can ask him your question. Did they hear uh, the previous question? Did you hear the previous question? Who's on from the Department of Revenue? The Department of Revenue. Yes. Can, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, Lacey Black. I am the manager of Driver Solutions. Um, I did hear your question, Senator Tyson. Um, so currently the, the definition of the revocation and the suspension, um, after a revocation, it does state that the driver should have to go in and completely um, obtain their driver's license like it's their first time again. Uh, we have not practiced that. Um, I don't have a clear answer as to why. I've been with the division for 12 years, and that's just not a, a policy we've ever done or a practice that we followed. But obviously, from this audit, we are looking at these things and potentially will be um, changing our current practice. Uh Representative Barker. Uh, just a quick question. Would you send out a letter to the, to the rider? Do you indicate whether they're suspended or revoked or have a revocation? Or have a revocation. Yes, sir. Uh, the letters clearly state what status their driving privileges are in. If there's a time frame, um, they clearly explain everything. But in your letter, do you say a uh, suspension or do you say a revocation? It depends on what action we're taking. So if, if it's a suspension for a failure to comply, then it would say your driving privileges are suspended as of the date of this letter. Um, if it's a revocation, it will say your driving privileges are revoked for, if it's a 90 day revocation, it would say for this time period and it would give the 90 day time period. Um, so yeah, depending on the action that we take, the letter explains that. And, and, uh, for example, on a habitual violator, habitual violator. is that a revocation? Is that a revocation? Yes, sir. A habitual violator would be a three-year revocation. So the letter would explain that they're revoked. It explains for what violations and the time period. Thank you very much. Thank it's been very helpful. Senator Tyson. Very helpful. Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank, thank you for your response. You. I, I have grave concern. I told this to constituents. I said, we write the laws, and there's full intent. However, if there's not enforcement, that is an issue. That is an issue. 
So could you explain why you're choosing not to enforce the law? Enforce the law. I um, thank you for your question. I, I honestly, I, I don't have an answer. Uh, like I said, I, I understand what it says. Um, this audit actually brought this to light to us as well. Um, and so we are going to look at that practice. Um, and going forward, if someone is revoked, once their time is up, they will have to go back into the exam office and be issued a license like it's their first time. So um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. I, I don't know where the policy changed. Um, I don't know if, you know, before I started with the division, if they practiced it that way and somewhere along the line, um, it, it changed for some reason. I, I really, I don't, I unfortunately don't have an answer for that, but we are going to look at this specific practice and we will be making updates to it. Maybe you could get us an answer for an meeting. That would be great. Uh, this looks like something we obviously like need so. to kind of take a, another look at. Uh, and obviously, we're not following it, but also the fees and that to make sure that everything's appropriate. So, uh, I They're aware. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, uh, I, I, it kind of looked like the audit probably didn't look into this aspect, but I'm wondering if maybe uh, uh, the young lady here could get, help me with uh, this answer. Do we have any idea what percentage of the failure to comply folks are not complying just because they live in poverty? Or how big a factor is that? That would be key to know that. It's for the Department of Revenue. I don't know if you've gotten that. Are you still on there? She's still on. She's still on. Yes, I'm still here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Um, we were trying to get unmuted there. Um, I, I do not have that information. Um, I, I don't have the percentage. Uh, we would have to. Yeah, I, I would have to look, I would have to do some further research for that. I don't know how you get that, but maybe that's something that we could, could that's gather it, um, yeah. do that at our next meeting. That at our next meeting. Does that help? Does that help? Is that? I apologize, I, I was unable to hear you. Uh, maybe you could get uh, that and get have, that. That for our next have meeting. that for our next meeting. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And, and just so I, I heard um, clearly, you wanted the percentage of um, drivers in poverty that are unable to pay for their failure to comply? I think that's the question. I think that's the question. Okay, yes, I can work on that. Thank you. Okay, we got one more. Uh, Representative yeah, uh, Uplicker. Uh, just uh, <clears throat> just uh, for the audit. For the audit. That'd be something that you could follow up on. That you could follow up on. Um, um, so we, we, so we were probably not with the data that we got for this audit. We don't have information as to the. I think your microphone online's on, so. Um, with, so with the data that we were provided for this audit, we wouldn't have access to people's personal financial information or anything like that. The Division of Vehicles would be able to tell you whether or not that information is even available. So, okay. um, Representative Barker? Oh, I just, uh, to help answer that question, they wouldn't have that information. Now, if they come into court and they file an affidavit of indigency, then the court would and consider that when they impose fines and reinstatement because they can waive that. So, but they would have to come in and ask, uh, tell the court that they are indigent. They would have to prepare an affidavit. They'd have to swear to it. And then the court, they may make them eligible for a court appointed attorney or the court to consider uh, waiving some of the fines or a partial part of the fines or the reinstatement fee. So the court would have that information, but not necessarily the driver's license bureau. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, we'll go ahead and move on then. It sounds like we're done there uh, to the follow-up audit. Maury? All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. So my name is Maury Exline. I'm the auditor that worked on this audit and Katrin Osterhaus was the manager on this audit. So the first audit that I'm going to be presenting to you today is the follow-up audit. And this was reviewing agencies' implementation of selected performance audit recommendations. So we were specifically following up on a January 2020 audit that our office um, published, which looked at the Department of Corrections and Judicial Administration um, Senate Bill 367 Juvenile Justice Reforms. So the question that we were wanting to answer with this audit was to what extent have the Department of Corrections and the Office of Judicial Administration implemented those audit reforms, or sorry, not those audit reforms, the recommendations that we made during that 2020 audit. So the short answer to that question is that uh, the Kansas Department of Corrections has implemented all three recommendations that pertain to them, and the Office of Judicial Administration has, administ has implemented one and is currently in the process of implementing the other recommendation. So I'm going to go through um, the information that we have here by recommendation um, so that we can kind of keep it all in the same um, topic. So the first finding that we had in that January 2020 audit was that the Kansas Department of Corrections and the Office, Office of Judicial Administration did not have complete data sets of juvenile offenders under their supervision or custody. So if you'll look at figure one on page four, this shows KDOC's implementation. Um, so we recommended that KDOC and OJA should implement um, complete data sets of juvenile offenders. And we did find that KDOC has implemented this recommendation. So their data system is called Athena. It was implemented in 2018. And we were able to see a recent data report from um, this system, which did have all judicial districts um, that had juvenile offender data. Um, so we did also look at their processes and procedures that they have in place to make sure that um, as long as those processes are followed, the data should be complete and accurate that comes out of that system. So moving on to OJA's implementation of this recommendation, and you can see that in figure two on page five. So um, we found that they are currently in progress of implementing a complete data set. So currently they are implementing a case management um, system that has a complete data set of the state. But right now, we only have, or OJA's system only has two of the 31 districts um, that have complete juvenile offender data. Um, however, again, we did look at their processes and procedures to make sure that um, if those processes, processes and procedures are um, in place, this data, when it is rolled out to the entire state, should have complete and accurate data. So that said, we're gonna to move to the second finding that that January 2020 audit came out with. So the second finding was that KDOC and OJA did not share, stage, or analyze data um, to ensure that the state has a comprehensive data set of juvenile offenders. So again, if you'll turn to page four, figure one, you can see that KDOC has implemented and actually KDOC and um, OJA have implemented this recommendation and OJA information on that is on page five. So a little bit about that, KDOC, OJA and DCF have come to a memorandum of agreement which went into effect on November 1st of 2021. Um, so this requires several fields, um, several bits of data for each one of those organizations to or agencies to gather from um, as far as their juvenile offenders, so that we will be able to merge that data and have a complete data set um, for the state if needed. So moving on to that third recommendation. So this one only applied to KDOC, and it was that KDOC did not have a process in place to ensure that judicial districts were using grant funds on appropriate community programs for juvenile offenders. 
So again, if you'll turn to page four, figure one, the third recommendation that we had was that they should develop a process um, to ensure that judicial districts are using reinvestment grant funds on appropriate programs. So you'll see again that they have implemented this recommendation. We did look at application materials and we also looked at um, the evaluation of application materials that KDOC does to ensure that all of the programs that are presented um, and applying to receive reinvestment grants are going towards um, statutorily okay <laughs> um, programs. So that said, we also looked at after the fact um, that KDOC um, does do annual fiscal reporting and quarterly reconciliations for each one of those grantees to ensure that um, that, that money is spent correctly. So I wanna bring your attention to page six to our potential issues for further consideration. I talked a little bit about OJA's centralized case management system, um, but we had concerns about um, the progress of the centralized case management system. So just a little information about this. Um, OJA has been in the process of implementing the centralized case management system since 2017. Um, in in the beginning, the projected completion date was August of 2021. Um, however, in the last um, couple years, so 2020 and 2021, their testimony to the Joint Committee on Information Technology has um, said that there are delays based on the pandemic or due to the pandemic. Um, so in the most recent update to the Joint um, Committee on Information Technology and the most recent update that's posted on the OJA website, um, there is a large portion of the state that is still left as unscheduled. So um, this is just something that we ran into as we were working on this audit and we wanted to go ahead and bring that to you as a potential issue for further consideration. And with that, I am open for questions. Questions? Questions? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, we also have officials from the Judicial Administration here. Is there any questions for them? Not seeing any. We'll go ahead and move on to the tax credit for low uh, income student scholarship program. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. So again, my name is Maria Exline. Katrin Osterhaus was also the manager on this audit as well. So this audit was evaluating disbursements for the tax credit for low-income student scholarship program. Um, this, this audit request was brought to light in response of a January 2022 report, um, which listed program totals and just caused a little bit of concern as to um, compliance with distribution requirements. So the question that we wanted to answer with this audit was, have scholarship granting organizations dispersed tax credit for low-income student scholarship program contributions according to state law? So the short answer to this question is that yes, most scholarship granting organizations followed state law in dispersing tax credit for low-income student scholarship contributions. So before I get into the analysis here, I want to talk a little bit about the background. So this tax credit for low-income student scholarship program helps eligible students to attend private schools of their choice. It went into effect in 20, or it was passed in 2014 and went into effect in January of 2015. And taxpayers may claim a 70% tax credit of the donation amount for scholarship or for contributions that they give to scholarship granting organizations or SGOs. Um, and then those SGOs provide scholarships to eligible students. So currently eligible students can be from any Kansas public school um, as long as they qualify for free and reduced lunch. So in total, scholarship granting organizations received just over 15.5 million in contributions and dispersed just over 9 million in scholarships from January of 2015 to the end of last school year, which ended in May 31st of 2021. So this does not include this current school year. So I wanna bring your attention to figure one on page three. 
this does a this shows you a breakdown of each of the scholarship granting organizations, how much money they received, and um, how much money they dispersed. And then if you'll look at figure two on page four, it also shows the program and the growth that it has had over the last several years. So if you're interested in that, take a look at those two figures. Um, so I want to draw your attention to this requirement that is really the purpose of this audit. So that was that the Kansas law requires that 90% of contributions for the tax credit program be dispersed within 36 months. So there are a couple other requirements for SGOs as well, that they have to submit a report to KSDE by June 1st of each year. And this report has to include totals of disbursements and contributions. They also must undergo financial audits by a certified CPA for each calendar year. So based on our analysis, we estimated that most SGOs did meet the statutory requirement to disperse at least 90% of contributions within three years. So we were only able to calculate contributions and distributions by year because the data that we had available was based on the annual reports that KSDE receives from SGOs, which has those annual totals of distributions and contributions. So our analysis used a first in, first out concept um, in order to calculate whether SGOs distributed 90% of each year's contribution within three years. So I want to go ahead and draw your attention to figure three on page six, because I'll be explaining a little bit about those two SGOs that did not meet this requirement. So the Catholic Diocese of the Salina Education Fund um, received a scholarship or a contribution in the 2018 school year, which should have been distributed by 90% by the 2021 school year. However, this SGO did not, dis did not have any distributions through 2021. So the other organization that did not meet this requirement was the independent school, and the independent school um, did not meet the, re the requirement twice. So the first time, um, they received a contribution in 2015, um, and then they did not distribute any money until 2019, which was four years after that original contribution. Then in 2018, the school or the independent school received another contribution or more contributions. Um, and they did distribute a large portion of this, but not quite 90%. So there was a shortfall of $6,500 um, at the end of the third year or at the end of the three year time frame. So we did want to talk to these SGOs to better understand maybe why this was happening. Um, so the officials from the independent school did tell us that no eligible students applied to their school during that time, and that's why they were unable to hand out those scholarships. Officials from the Salina Diocese told us that no public schools in their area met the 100 lowest performing schools requirement that was in place at the time. So currently, the, that requirement does not exist. That um, re existed prior to 2021. So we did go ahead and talk to um, several other SGOs just to kind of better understand the program and understand whether or not these are problems that exist um, program-wide. So officials from five of the six SGOs mentioned similar difficulties in distributing funds, that finding qualified students was a struggle. But those officials also told us that um, the changes that were made in 2021 have significantly made this better and have made it a lot easier to find eligible students. Um, so they are confident that in the future they'll be able to distribute funds more easily. So the final thing that we looked at in our audit, um, this is page seven. It we went in and talked to KSDE about their monitoring process and whether or not, um, what kinds of things they're doing to monitor compliance with the 90% requirement. So state law does require the State Board of Education to certify SGO compliance with state law each year. 
So um, KSD staff does monitor compliance, but they do so at a really high level. So they're using cum cumulative percentages um, to determine whether or not uh, money is being distributed. However, this is based on annual totals, again, and not based on month. And so um, as the state law says, this needs to be within 36 months, not a year time frame. So we did ask them, um, they were able to catch some of those errors that we caught, um, but they were the system that they currently have in place is only able to catch the more obvious errors, like when some SGO does not have any disbursements for multiple years. Um, so we did talk to KSD about why there is not monthly information available. Um, and they told us that that's because statute only requires SGOs to report based on the year totals. However, the um, State, Board of, State Board of Education does have the statutory ability to require additional information from SGOs if needed. So that brings me to the recommendation that we made, and that's on page eight. We did recommend that KSDE staff should require or should request and analyze monthly contributions and disbursement data needed in order to monitor SGO's compliance with the 90% distribution requirement in state law. So we did talk to KSDE about this and they agreed. They told us that they will be implementing a form asking SGOs to break out contributions and disbursements on a monthly basis with this next coming cycle. And with that, I am open to questions. Questions? Uh, Representative Toppler? In order to get a tax credit for a contribution, who does a taxpayer, is that on your income tax return, or um, how would you file for that tax credit? Thank you for your question. Um, so. Essentially, what they the process is that they will apply to, uh, or they will give the donation to um, the SGOs, and then SGOs will kind of make a cert certificate. Will tell Kador that this person gave a gave a scholarship, and then um, they go through Kador to claim that scholarship during the tax season when they file their taxes. Sounds to me like. If distributions are not made like they're supposed to be made, that <clears throat> Kansas Department of Revenue maybe should revoke the uh, tax credit uh, from the uh, person making the contribution. Because the whole purpose of the, this whole program is to get the money out there where it's needed. And why should people be getting a tax credit for something that isn't um, actually going to be used. So, comment, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll just respond to that, give you a little bit of background on, on it. When you make a donation to an SGO, you may have in mind that you want kids to learn and excel and to get into an environment where they can achieve the highest degree, especially, you know, we're talking about low-income students. So you make that donation, let's say it's to the Catholic diocese, and that Catholic diocese, you can't designate a child. So you're not, you. you there's no way for you to hold you are not responsible for the diocese not being able to place students. So you wouldn't want to take a tax credit that you gave to a citizen of Kansan to give for a good cause that benefits Kansans and then remove it because the SGO was not able. The other thing you should notice is in the audit, it said 90% 90, 90 of those that they reviewed were in compliance. Two were not, and it was because the law didn't allow them to. Can you imagine if you had to have students only from the 100 lowest performing schools and you have none in your area? And that's why we changed the law. So I don't think you're gonna find that non-compliance in the future. In addition, independent school only had a deficit of 6,500 out of that $100,000. So we're talking about a low number of, and generally it's that they didn't find a match of a student that either they recognize or that applied. And so I don't think that the, the intention is solid, and I don't think that there's any need to um, remove 
the next step, which is take the tax credit away from the citizen that gave it. It'd be the same thing if you gave to a nonprofit like United Way and they didn't spend your money completely 100 percent, you know, within the bounds of whatever their bylaws were. Go ahead and respond. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what, you know, if, if that's going to be the situation or has been, then can money be transferred from one SGO to another that, that needs it or that can distribute it? Go ahead and respond. Okay, I think, Mr. Chairman, just in a quick, a quick explanation, um, I, I'm certainly they're private entities with their own 501c3. So if they wanted to make arrangement, they could. But I want you to think of it this way: it's about a child in a school. It's really not the SGO. The SGO has the scholarship monies that are kind of like that broker in between. But let's say you have a school district, or not a school district, you have a school, a private school that has multiple SGOs that may be providing students to that school. They, if, one, if one STO doesn't have the money, they have access, they know who the others are. They could contact another SGO and say, could you help us? We have a student that we would like to, to admit into our school, enroll in our school. So that really hasn't been a problem at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, uh, Representative Williams answered most of that question that I had about their, their private 501c3s, basically. Um, is there any situation in which where they are never able to give uh, or participate in the program where they can be pulled out of the program? I mean, do, do we have any kind of oversight? So there's, you know, if you've, you've got these two that haven't been able to comply completely, uh, I'm just kind of wondering if there's any kind of teeth um, in, in this program to where if there was any kind of abuse uh, that we could remo that those people could re be removed from the list of the STOs that operate within the fund. Yeah, thank you for your question. So yes, that is um, if scholarship granting organizations do not distribute ninety percent of the funds within three years or thirty six months is what statute says, um, then they are not able to take in more donations until that ninety percent is spent. And so that is what happened with the independent school and with um, the Catholic Diocese of Salina, um, that they were removed from that certified list of SGOs at that time. Um, but again, our, our concern is that in the future, especially as this program grows, as you see that growth in the program, um, that it will, you know, these errors may not be as obvious. And so um, in order to make sure that SGOs are, you know, having that clawback, as you said, um, and not being able to accept further donations until that 90% is spent, then um, there needs to be a little bit better um, keeping track of that monthly donations to make sure that they're meeting the 90% requirement. But there is something in place. Go ahead, Senator Tom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick follow-up. Are, are these SGOs, do they exist solely for this purpose or do they have other charitable functions as well? Are you aware? Yeah, thank you for your question. So essentially they can, but they also can be a certified 501c3. So I think that most of them also do other things. Like currently the ones that are on our list do other things as well. Um, but I it looks like it's possible for somebody to exist solely for this purpose as well. So would it be possible for those funds to intermingle with some of their other operational? There is somebody gets a tax, you know, donates, gets a tax credit. That money doesn't necessarily go where it's supposed to go. Yeah. Thanks for your question. The, the, the checks that are currently in place. So I mentioned a little bit about how SGOs have to be, um, have to undergo CPA financial audits every year. And those CPA audits do um, check on commingling of funds. And so I did go through and look at all of those um, audits that have happened over the course. And I can tell you I, that I saw commingling several times that they are checking. Okay. So that is a requirement of the, um, I don't know the exact number of them that specifically state that they're not commingling funds, but I can tell you I saw it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? Uh, 
Representative Topliger. Are the contributors that are getting these tax breaks notified when uh, money isn't dispersed? Uh, so, for example, uh, if we know that an, uh, an organization, a uh, scholarship granting authority uh, organization isn't uh, distributing according to law, shouldn't we be notifying the people that are contributing and getting a 70% tax credit, shouldn't we notify them that, hey, the, the, this uh, organization that you contributed to uh, is not doing what they're supposed to be doing or can't or for whatever reason, shouldn't they know that if they're getting a, uh, and uh, especially if, as you said, you suspended the, not you, but the, these, uh, some of these SGOs were suspended for not distributing the money. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't their contributors know that? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so I can say that I've, I haven't seen in statute anything about notifying specific taxpayers, and um, but that wasn't something that we looked at specifically. Um, we didn't look at any kind of communication between tax, between the SGOs and the taxpayers um, as far as whether or not that should be something in, in statute or in the program. That's for you guys to decide as the legislature. Do you know, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, do, do you know, uh, it looks like a taxpayer may donate up to a half million per year. Mm -hmm. And do you know if anybody has done that? I do not. We so, sorry. Thank you for your question. So, essentially, the the data that we got was based on annual totals. So we did not get down to the granular level of individual contributions. Um, so that said, I don't know whether anybody has made uh, like any numbers of how of what contributions were. So. I can't tell you that. I do know that um, I believe that information is available through possibly KDOR or possibly the SGOs if you are interested. All right, thank you. Thank you. Representative Williams. Thank you, and I'll be the last comment. But I would refer you back to page three where we're talking about just the list of uh, NGOs that are on that, uh, SGOs that are on that page, and 60% of the money has been paid out. And the reason that you don't get 100% all the time is because you're going to gain, you're going to get contributions, and then you're going to get scholarships. You're going to get different, different amounts at different times. You're not always going to have the applicants. You're not always going to have the students. Um, if it was a historical tax credit and you gave it to your local theater and you received a historical tax credit, 75% or whatever that might be, the state of Kansas doesn't send you a notice and say, look, the theater is four months behind on getting their project done. These individuals, whether they're, whether they're giving $10,000 or $500,000, are investing in lives of Kansans. And those scholarships will be used because the statute set and the CPA is the check and balance. They don't get to take in one more dollar if they don't place kids. So I think it's a great program. And I just wanted to um, caution the committee that this is actually a really good report, that it is working. Thank you. Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On page three of the report, figure one, I had some questions on the scholarships, mm -hmm. ACE scholarships out of Denver, Colorado, mm -hmm. um, another one out of Roanoke, Virginia. Yes. Do you explain? Yeah, thanks for your question. So basically, um, anybody, any kind of SGO or any nonprofit organization, um, as long as they're taking in money from Kansans and giving it to back to Kansans, um, would qualify to be a part of this program um, to be an SGO. So ACE Scholarships and um, Renew a Nation is the other one that's out of Virginia. So those are specific um, nonprofits that work with private education. And so it's just, they're just organizations that people can um, donate to that specifically work for, like, care about private education as their mission statement. So thank you. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask a follow-up. Is there a priority or anything in statute that sets Kansas first before these out-of-state organizations and priorities for the tax credits? I, yeah, I, I can't say off the top of my head whether or not that is um, a specifically stated. Sorry. Go ahead, Representative Williams. Okay, just an explanation to that. That's not how it would operate. Imagine that if you had a Catholic school, and I'm going to use that then because they're, right, well, but that's not how it operates with this. And here's the example. You have a school, we'll, we'll just use independent since it's it's not uh, associated with anyone. They could have any one of these organizations that provide a student. And however they identify that student, the idea is that the student is funded. In ACE's situation, they're a natural, national organization that has expertise in working with school districts and providing that resource, whereas many others are parochial, meaning they, they are um, related to their faith and they're just local, and dioceses are very you know, well adept at this. But for the most part, that's not the case. So if you're a non-Catholic school, then that's where ACE comes in. So to distinguish and say that a student that goes through ACE shouldn't get priority. They're all Kansas students is what I would say. They're all Kansas students. Go ahead, Senator. Thank you, Tom. Mr. Chairman. I'm, I understand that. What I understand also is that we are looking at out-of-state entities and managing these resources, and I always feel like it should be Kansas as a priority on managing the resources and accessibility to the resources. It's much like the CanCare system. We put that out of out for bid, and it's out of state corporations managing our healthcare systems. I just it always raises a flag for me. I appreciate the report and the data. Thank you. Okay. One follow up, and then we're going to move on. Okay, uh, just a uh, quick question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have a a statewide cap of ten million dollars on this program for the tax credits, and just wondered why. If it's a great program, why is there a $10 million cap? Can anybody answer that? Well, I'll answer it, Representative Williams. You probably know it better than anybody. Well, I was just going to say because that was what the legislators came up with when they started that program. And everything we have has a cap. The Promise Act has a $10 million cap. You know, we don't just give endless amounts of for, for most uh, of our incentives. There is some version of some type of cap or... So that's why. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Thank you. Thank you, Maury. Uh, we'll move on to um, trans and social worker employees uh, by school districts. Tanner? Yes. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, this is the trans and social workers employed by school districts audit. It was a limited scope audit. My name is Tanner Rohr, and I supervised this limited scope audit. Kristen Roddinghouse was the audit manager. This audit has one question. How has the number of social workers employed by school districts changed in recent years? To answer this question, we used employment data uh, that school districts send to KSD for school years 2019 to 2021 and interviewed staff from five school districts and five community mental health centers, also known as CMHCs, to learn about hiring practices school districts have for social workers and how these practices might impact stakeholders like CMHCs. The short answer to our overall question is that the number of social workers in Kansas school districts has increased over the last few years. We'll start with some background, which begins on page two of the report. School districts employ staff like social workers, counselors, and psychologists uh, to provide mental health services to their students. These staff each have distinct licensures and backgrounds, but school districts can hire licensed staff to fill a role that is different from their license. For example, school districts sometimes hire licensed social workers to work as counselors instead of doing social work. Recently, school districts have expressed a growing need for mental health services, but mental health staff are generally difficult to hire because there's a widespread shortage of these types of staff. The legislature created the Mental Health Intervention Team Program in school year 2019 to increase the access students in Kansas schools have to mental health care. 
The program intended for school districts and CMHCs to work together by creating teams dedicated to providing mental health care services for the students. These teams that are a part of the mental health intervention team program consist of school liaisons, which are school employees who help identify students in need and then communicate with all parties in order to best serve students. Then there are also case managers, which are CMHC employees who also help identify students in need and communicate, communicate with all parties, including school districts, families, the students, and other CMHC employees. And then the case managers also participate in treatment planning. Then there are clinical therapists who develop treatment plans and provide clinical care to students in need. They are also CMHC employees. These staff provide their services inside the schools, so these mental health resources are more readily available to students. This program has been reauthorized and expanded each school year. There is some concern that this program has not had, an, had its intended impact on school districts hiring practices. Generally, CMHCs and school districts both need to hire mental health staff and the pool of these staff available to hire is limited. Before the program, this meant that some school districts and CMHCs were competing for staff. This program intended to reduce this competition by increasing collaboration between CMHCs and school districts. For any districts that had trouble finding mental health staff to hire, this program intended to increase the access these districts have to mental health resources without taking any resources from CMHCs. If you turn to page four of the report, you'll find the section on the trend work we did to answer our primary audit question. We examined KSDE's licensed personnel report data from school year 2019 to school year 2022. Based on this data, you'll see the overall number of social workers employed by school districts in Kansas has increased. Specifically, Kansas school districts reported around a 13% increase in total licensed mental health staff FTE, and that includes a 29% increase in social worker staff FTE from school year 2019 to 2022. A breakdown of these totals can found, be found on figure one on page five of the report. There are a couple other conclusions we drew from the data because the overall increase varied depending on a couple of things like the year in which we examined, the type of staff we examined, and by which districts we examined. For example, 59% of the total increase in licensed mental health staff FTE occurred very recently in school year 2022. 58% uh, of the total increase in licensed mental health staff FTE uh, was due to an increase just in social worker FTE alone. Psychologists and counselors also had increases, but much less. The five school districts reporting the largest in increases in mental health staff FTE accounted for 40% of the total overall increase. The largest district in Kansas alone was 10% of this total increase. The majority of districts, which is 66% or so, reported employing the same number of social workers during that time. These conclusions are explained in slightly more detail in the report if you're interested. We included both social workers specifically and licensed mental health staff overall in our analysis because of some limitations we encountered with the data we, we examined. We learned about these inconsistencies and limitations when we spoke to the five school districts and KSD officials. The primary limitation we encountered was that school districts don't consistently report their FTE to KSDE on the licensed personnel report. And KSDE doesn't provide specific guidance to school districts that specifies how they should be reporting their FTE to this report. This means that KSD's licensed personal, uh, personnel report data provides a general idea of the overall mental health staffing trends but doesn't give uh, accurate, accounts, accurate accounts for specific staff position FTE within districts. However, it's the best data available to show the overall trend. Details on these limitations we encountered can be found on the bottom half of page five and then continuing on the top of page six of the report. And now if you turn to the bottom of page six, you'll find a section on the opinions uh, community mental health centers and school districts have regarding the mental health intervention team program. The five CMHCs and school districts we interviewed generally had positive experiences to report with the program. 
The CMHCs we interviewed believe that this program increases the access that students have to their mental health care resources by placing their therapists and other staff inside the schools. Further, they think the program created communication channels between themselves and the school districts um, and the families uh, as well. The school districts had similar feelings. They said the program has a positive, positive overall impact on their students. And then they also believe the program is fulfilling its intended purpose by increasing the access uh, students have to mental health resources. However, one extra note is that CMHCs reported losing staff to school districts. CMHCs reported that uh, this program could have resulted in uh, licensed mental health staff that they employ, including social workers in some instances, leaving the CMHCs to work for school districts. The CMHCs we spoke with suggested that placing their staff in schools leads the staff to realize all of the benefits there are for working for schools. These benefits include higher pay, for instance. Uh, there's it's usually around a $10,000 per year salary gap, and there's a little bit more information in the report if you're interested on those numbers. Um, and, and then also a more attractive lifestyle because of longer holidays and shorter work days in general. On page eight, you'll see we made one recommendation in this audit. That is, KSDE should develop and distribute guidance to school districts uh, on how to report their licensed mental health staff, um, including how to define staff FTE for each category in the licensed personnel report. That way, they can more, a little bit more easily distinguish between social workers, psychologists, counselors, and it, there can be a unified system as a whole. Um, with that, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So on page four, you give us percentages, but we don't have an idea of how many total social workers we're talking about, for example, in our school districts. We know that they've increased 29%. So do you have that number? So you're asking about the number like of the total, total number. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that uh, runs into the limitations that we encountered with the data because we weren't able to like come up with a, a solid, like perfectly accurate that we were happy with amount of the total social or social workers. Um, so there there are some estimates in the figure that you see on page five um, of the total, but we. I would view those with caution uh, due to the limitations that I listed, um, just because um, there's there, there's some inconsistent reporting. Sometimes social workers are school counselors and they're reported as such, and other times other school districts do it the opposite way, where the social workers are only social workers and school counselors are reported as counselors. So we can't exactly be sure of a total number. Okay, I appreciate that. And then just a final note is that this, the audit was focusing on whether or not school districts are creating some hardship for our uh, mental health uh, community centers. And I think, in fact, you know, there's evidence in this report that says it, it is tougher for those CM. Uh, HCs to compete with school districts because school districts pay more and have better benefits and then the summer's off as well. The other note that this committee might uh, consider for future reference is that some school districts, uh, Shawnee Mission is one school district, has replaced counselors, for example, in their elementary schools almost entirely, 100%. So what you're doing then, if you have 30 elementary uh, social workers that now are taking the place of counselors, then what you're in essence doing is having non-licensed, remember counselors are licensed teachers, in the classroom, giving surveys, taking data, doing psychological profiles, putting kids in group based on grit, anxiety, and then that data then stays with that child forevermore. Um, so just wanted to let y'all know that the increase in social workers is going to be something that will probably want to revisit in the legislature. Thank you. Representative Tupperlicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the state is spending money for these CMHC's uh, organizations to partner with the school districts and legislation was passed in 2019 uh, to increase students' access to mental health. Okay, so did you find at all that districts are 
resisting um, working with the state and want to just hire their own uh, employee to handle issues? Um, we, we, like I said, we only spoke with five school districts, so I, I can't speak to the entire, um, like, uh, to every school district in Kansas. Though, and, and as I mentioned, those school districts that we spoke with, they were a fan. They, they cited being a fan of, uh, a fan. They, they enjoyed and had positive feelings and experiences with the program so far. Okay, because the way it is, or sounds like will be, or the trend is, is that we're spending money with the state program and then we're spending it over here again in the school district. So, you know, it looks like there's, we're doubling up and maybe, maybe that's an issue too. Um, it, it sounds like it could be in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you for the questions or comments. Uh, Senator Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just dovetail with Representative Topliker. I, I, it, it looks like the local school districts are, are then competing against the state for employees and winning the battle, uh, creating problems for KDADs. Um, this looks to be a problem, <laughs> a real problem. You know, it, it, maybe there shouldn't be. I, you know, I don't know how you separate this out, but uh, th this, all I can say is it just, this kind of uh, highlights a real problem for the community mental health centers um, in retaining employees and be able to carry out their functions at the school districts, which are apparently flush with cash, are able to hire them away at, at a substantially increased uh, salary. Um, so I think this is something that needs further investigation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Williams, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to kind of clarify on this, this program, CMCH, uh, I always get that wrong, CMHC, with the school districts, this is, this type of mental health pilot program is only about 19 or 20 school districts. So you've got 286 school districts in Kansas. We're only talking about a handful of them that have these mental health pilot uh, projects. <clears throat> they also have the data completely. You, This would be one of those programs where you could look and see at all the outcomes. Were they attending school? How, you know, how many days? Um, did they have any suspensions? Um, how many interactions, negative interactions, and so forth? So that's always available too. So I would say it's an excellent program. What we're having the issue with, and your question is, are school districts hiring social workers. They don't need to for this program. They need a school liaison. And a school liaison could be a counselor, it could be just an, an employee that they choose or select for that purpose. And then outside of that, you've got your psychologist or counselor and um, your social workers. That's outside of that. They don't need to. What they're doing at school districts is they're, by, they're hiring social workers for a plethora of other reasons that are outside and beyond this. So there may be a few instances that were reported in here, but overall, what the CMHCs are saying is that, yes, the school districts are hiring social workers. It's not this program that's necessarily uh, the main cause of it. That's the short answer. Or where? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think we should keep in mind that, uh, especially in, in where it comes to, to mental health, that the schools are not flush with money. No school, no public school is flush with money. Thank you. Representative Barker? I, I just want to get back to uh, Representative uh, Williams's comment. You know, we're losing counselors, people who are trained, are licensed school teachers. That they've chosen to go into counseling, and, and, I, and I wasn't that many years ago that I was in high school. And my counselor had a great impact on my life. And, and instead of we're going with social workers, you know, in, in my district, we were contracting with Central Kansas Mental Health, and when we needed social workers, they could bring them in. But to have them full time on staff taking the place of school counselors, uh, I, I think that's a wrong avenue for us to be taking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Just one more, Mr. Chair. Senator Topliker? 
Or Representative Tupperger, sorry. Thank you. Um, the recommendation that um, the audit staff is making is that um, we uh, define staff FTE. So my question is what will that do to help the issues? What, what, will, that, what will that solve? What will that do? Um, I, I'm not sure how much I can exactly speak to that, but I, I could say that if there is further interest in examining this and specifically examining the data, then that would remove some of the limitations, at least at least some of the limitations we ran into for this audit examining the data. So that if, if there is a future project to be done, then uh, it, then they then whoever does it could. Um, examine that data without those limitations and maybe come to a new conclusions or just conclusions without those limitations, I guess is what I would say. Any further questions? Uh, Representative Williams? It is only a question. So um, did you happen to, you know, on this idea of social workers versus counselors, did you actually look to see how many of the school liaisons, the one that's hired by the school district, are counselors versus social workers versus something else kind of coming back to the question. Yeah, uh, not not in detail, but as part of our conversations with school districts, we do know that it happens sometimes in some instances. Um, so sometimes school liaisons are, uh, school districts do hire social workers as uh, school liaisons. How often it happens statewide, um, we only have the information with our five school districts and it's not necessarily projectable to all uh, 286. So. Um, it, it, it's, it'd be difficult to say how much of an issue that actually is. Mr. Someone. Chairman, is KSDE going to be with us today? Um, I don't see him here. Okay. So. Perhaps we'll just take that question to them. I mean, we can also look at maybe doing a, a follow-up audit or a 100-hour audit to answer that question. I definitely have uh, concerns uh, that you're kind of Bringing and and uh, Representative uh, Barker's brought. I mean, uh, deeply concerned that you know so many social workers have been employed uh, over counselors. Um, you know, it looks like uh, you know one's dealing with the mental health of the student; the other is looking at their future. Um, you know, uh, what's going on and why? Why are these changes being made? I, I think this is one that. The legislature, maybe the education committees, should take a super deep dive. Uh, but I think we could probably uh, maybe look at some kind of 100 hour audit to um, find out how many social workers, how many counselors, how many have been removed. So I think I would like to look at that myself. So, is there any further comments or questions on this? Not seeing any, we'll go ahead and move on uh, to the consent calendar. Thank, uh, go ahead, Kristen, tab A. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, so our consent calendar today is pretty simple. We've just got two items on it. Um, as mentioned, that's in tab A for you. Um, so the first item is approval of the minutes from the last meeting, which was March 30th. Um, you can find those in attachment A. And then the second item on the consent calendar is approval of the performance audits that were presented today. So those four limited scope audits, one on um, driver's license suspensions, the other the follow-up audit, a third one on the tax credit for low-income student scholarship program, and the fourth one being the trends in social workers employed by school districts. Do we have any questions for Christian? Do we uh, have any? Okay, the minutes, uh, uh, okay, is there any motions to object to the consent calendar? Not seeing any? Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the performance audit request, which is in tab B. Um, go ahead, Kristen. And this, we'll go through them all, if that's all right, and then if there's questions, we can come back to the ones there's questions. And uh, then we've got a couple of legislators here that want to speak too. So go ahead, Kristen. 
All right, uh, with that, if you all want to turn to tab B, I'm actually gonna take you a little bit out of order here, but try to give you a little bit of context before we get into actually um, talking about each of the proposals. So as you'll notice in tab B, there are two attachments and I'm gonna take you to attachment B, which shows the audit schedule. Um, so they're on like the left-hand side with the, the boxes that are color-coded in that red and blue, and there's a couple black ones. Those are the projects that we are currently working on or had just wrapped. And then you'll notice on the right-hand side uh, is audits that we'll be doing in 2023. So there are actually a few statutorily required audits that we will need to do in 2023. We'll come back at a later date uh, to have you approve those. But for the purposes of this meeting, what we're talking about is having you all select topics that will fill in the space between those two. Um, so what we're asking for today is for you all to choose around six topics. Um, I would mention that anything that you don't choose can be resubmitted. So that is something that I will reach out to the requester about um, following today's meeting closer toward actually probably the end of this calendar year to see if that's something that they would like to um, re-raise for the committee's consideration next April when we go through this process again. Um, also, if we do get any new audit requests that come up throughout the year, we'll kind of take those as they come up and you would have the opportunity at that point to either approve it and then move something that you've selected today um, or it's, again, if it's something that you all did not choose, then I would work with that person um, to potentially come back and that'd be something you could consider next April as well. So just a couple kind of uh, pieces of information for context before we start going through each of the topics. Okay. We have a question. We, um, do you have a question? Yes. Um, on um, the 1E, the, the E de designation and the L designation, um, the E is um, the staff, and so um, are you, are those automatically gonna be done, or are those some that we pick from? Uh, the, those are ones you'll pick that, from. That will, will be in the six that we pick. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but you have the option to choose them. So I'll highlight as we walk through them which ones are staff topics and which ones are legislative requests. Um, you don't have to choose the staff ones. They're just um, per committee rule, something that we are supposed to add to the mix. So you all get the option to see it, choose it if you want to, don't choose it if you don't want to. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so um, as mentioned, there I know a few legislators here as well to talk on their behalf. I'll kind of walk through what you have in front of you in, in attachment A. Um, has kind of a summary document at the beginning that takes the first six pages. And then following that, you will actually see copies of each individual proposal um, with the full information if you want to see that there as well. Um, so all of the requests are new requests and they aren't in any particular order other than just how I wrote them when they came in. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump into attachment A and just kind of summarize the, there are 13 um, topics for you all to consider. So looking at the first one, so number 1E, um, as Representative Tobliker pointed out, that is a staff request. Um, so this particular one would have us review agencies' um, implementation of past um, performance audit recommendations, so similar to the audit that Maury presented today, um, committee rule requires that we put this topic in front of you all. Again, you don't have to choose it. Um, we're simply required to um, put it out there as something you might consider. So in this particular one, um, we are suggesting that we would follow up on three recommendations from a November 2020 um, audit of the Department of Agriculture's price verification inspection process. Follow, we would also follow up on one recommendation from the November 2020 Angel Investor Tax Credit Program audit, and then follow up on three recommendations from a December, December 2019 audit of at-risk. 
Um, so that is topic 1E, moving on to topic 2E. So again, this is a staff request. Um, this actually also um, is related to an audit that was presented today. So um, that would have us evaluate the status of the Office of Judicial Administration's Centralized Case Management Project. Um, so again, this was the item for further consideration in Maury's, uh, the limited scope that she presented today. Um, it raises questions. Um, this would have us look at questions related to things like the project's revised timeline, cost estimate, and factors that contributed to any cost overruns or time delays. Um, so that in would include three questions, um, which are, has the ju judicial branch adhered to applicable project monitoring laws and requirements for the uh, project? Has the project cost estimate and implementation timeframe changed? And then has the IT project plan incorporated sufficient and adequate security controls to comply with state and federal requirements for criminal justice da data? The third topic uh, is also a staff topic, looking at evaluating um, access to sensitive locations within the Capitol complex. Um, similar to the others, this is born out of other audit work that our office has done. Um, so two recently conducted IT security audits noted issues uh, regarding potentially broad access to sensitive areas within the state's capital complex. Um, so this would include just a single question that would have us look at um, whether or not the state adequately manages access um, to those uh, locations. So moving on to 4L, so this is um, unlike the others, this is the first of the legislative requests. Uh, so this one comes from Representative Christy Williams and would have us review community college athletic programs. Uh, legislators have expressed concern that community college athletic programs may be funded by local and state taxpayers, but most athletes come from other counties or other states. Uh, this audit would have us look at um, three different questions that would include um, how much community colleges spent on, ath on athletic programs in recent years and the source of those funds, um, the percentage of community college athletes who come from outside of the county where the community college is located and how that's changed, and how many community college athletes received scholarships in the last 10 years and where those athletes were from. Topic 5L is also a legislative request. This comes from uh, several representatives, so including Representative uh, John Barker, Representative Will Carpenter, Representative Brenda Landwehr, and Representative Sean Tarwater. Uh, this would have us evaluate how the University of Kansas Hospital and Medical Center use revenues from the federal 340B drug pricing program uh, so the 340B drug pricing program is a federal program. Um, it requires pharmaceutical manufacturers that participate in Medicaid to provide outpatient drugs at discounted prices to certain healthcare providers. Uh, legislators have expressed concerns about uh, the size of that, that federal program and how savings are spent. So this audit would have us look at uh, one question, um, which is how the University of Kansas Hospital and Medical Center used revenues from the 340B drug pricing program. Uh, moving on to 6L, also a legislative request. Uh, this one from Representative Ron Highland and Representative Lindsey Vaughn would have us evaluate groundwater management districts efforts to conserve uh, water. So there are five groundwater management districts in Kansas uh, that cover parts of central and western Kansas. Legislators have expressed concern that groundwater management distri districts aren't effectively addressing the state's need to conserve groundwater resources or other concerns regarding the declining quality and quantity of water. Uh, so this audit would include three questions that would have us look at uh, the programs groundwater, groundwater management districts administered and whether they are appropriate. Um, if districts have identified areas of concern within their districts 
and whether or not they have programs that effectively address those concerns, and how much districts spent in the most recent year and what percentage was related to uh, the things that address those identified areas of concern. The next topic is 7L. Uh, this one is requested by Representative Carl Turner and would have us review the Department of Revenue's procedures to ensure correct payment of sales and compensating use taxes on motor vehicle sales. Uh, so in 2003, we legislative post audit uh, actually reviewed something like this and found that dealers and individuals did not always collect and remit all sales and use taxes on vehicle sales like they were supposed to. Um, so legislators are interested in knowing whether and to what extent these types of issues still exist. Um, so the audit would include two questions. Um, one, looking at the uh, whether or not the Kansas Department of Revenue has adequate procedures to ensure that all sales and compensating use, use taxes are remitted to the state. And the second question would deal with Kansas's processes for collecting sales and compensating use taxes and how those compare to other states. Um, moving on to 8L, this is also a legislative request. Um, this one from Representative Tori Marie Arnberger that would have us assess the impact of permanent work from home options. And legislators have expressed interest, um, you know, the most recent couple of years um, and understanding how many state employees could permanently work from home and what benefits and costs that might create for the state. Um, so this audit would include two questions. The first would be um, how many state employees could potentially work from ho home all or part of the time. And then the second part of this would look at the impact that that might have on state costs, hiring and productivity. Um, so that takes us to 9E. So unlike uh, the ones we just talked about, this one is back to being a staff request, our staff topic. Um, it would have us review the Department of Corrections process for collecting parole supervision fees. Um, so we went, we kind of regularly go out and read other states audit reports and we saw one from North Dakota where they looked at their Department of Corrections and found that their department was spending significant resources um, billing and then collecting parole supervision fees. So the purpose of this audit would be to evaluate the efficiency of our Department of Corrections supervisory fee collection process and learn about potential improvements. So this audit would include two questions, um, one dealing with Kansas's processes for collecting parole supervision fees and whether or not it's effective. And the second one would in, um, include things that Kansas could do to improve that collections process or decrease costs. Um, topic 10E is also a staff request. Um, it would have us evaluate fees at the state's public universities. A recent California audit found that university fees were growing more rapidly than tuition in the last several years, and that the methods and policies universities used to set and increase fees had some problems. Um, so we would, again, look at how this works in Kansas. It would be two questions. Um, the first of those is how much in fees do universities collect and how has that changed? And then the second question is, um, is the process universities use to set and increase fees reasonable and appropriate? And then that takes us to 11L which is back to being a legislative request. Uh, this one from Senator Dennis Pyle and would have us review Kansas's procedures for election security. Um, legislators have expressed interest in knowing whether Kansas has procedures to address legal requirements related to things like the accuracy and security of voting equipment, data transmission and training for election staff, among other things. Um, and then whether the state is adequately prepared for future elections. So the idea here is that 
um, state law outlines some things that should happen. We would look um, to county elections officials to see what sort of evidence or things they can provide to show that they have things in place with more of a kind of future oriented um, look. So this audit would include five questions. The first of those would include uh, whether or not Kansas County election offices have adequate policies and procedures to ensure the accuracy and security of voting machines used for elections. The second question would include whether or not county election officials have adequate policies and procedures to ensure the security of storage units, ballots, and devices used to tabulate votes. The third question would include, uh, how do Kansas's practices for maintaining and sharing ballot images and cast vote records compare to other states' practices? A fourth question would look at whether or not county elections officers receive adequate training. And then the fifth question would include what policies and practices the Secretary of State and county election officials have to protect the integrity of voting for long-term care facility residents. That takes us to topic 12L, which is also a legislative request. This one from Representative Susan Kincannon. Um, it may sound familiar. It also deals with the federal 340B drug pricing program, um, but this one kind of looking at it from a different angle. So. 5L is the other topic that deals with the 340B program. That would look at how healthcare providers spend savings through the program. This one, 12L, would look at what changes have occurred um, recently that have affected the savings that healthcare providers receive and then what the impact has been on those providers. Um, so this audit would include one question, which is how have requirements for covered entities under the 340B drug pricing program changed in recent years? And what do stakeholders say the impact has been on especially hospitals and federally qualified health centers? And then that takes us to the very last topic that you all have um, in front of you for consideration. That is 13L. So unlike the others, this, this is also a legislative request, but this one is actually coming from the Senate Ways and Means Committee as a whole. Uh, legislators have expressed concern that child support services in Kansas may not be effective or efficient in collecting child support payments. This audit would include three questions, including uh, whether or not child support services system is effective in collecting payments, um, whether or not child support services system provides timely services and payments, and then how Kansas's uh, system compares to other states. Okay. Um, is there any questions before we, we've got some members here that want to speak, but do we have any questions for Kristen? Uh, Representative Burroughs. Thanks, Kristen. Have the, the last one, 13L. I believe we have done an audit on that in the past. Am I mistaken? I think that we, and I'm looking to see if Chris is going to correct me on this. I feel like we've done an audit on this, but it's been a very long time ago. It seems like it was prior to uh, a privatization. We went to an outside firm doing some of that. They have brought it back in house. I can't remember, but I believe there may be an audit. We might want to research that a little bit. Yeah, I think um, we'll see if we can dig something up. I think if our office did, it's been a while back. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, um, Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on the differences between 5L and 12L, I, I know they're coming from two different perspectives. It is, would it be a consideration that we combine those two and expanded the scope of 5L? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, Representative Barker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for the question, Senator. Um, I have uh, consulted with my, uh, my partners on this audit. Uh, 
we were all on a 340B interim committee this past summer, uh, and that we made no recommendations. Uh, we prepared this, and now I talk to my my partners on this, and we're we're not going to push this uh, for not today. What we're thinking about doing is getting with uh, the other party who has an audit, and possibly next year consolidating them into one audit. Now, I've not talked with Representative Kit Cannon about that. I've just talked to my three. Uh, but remember, the 340B is a federal program. We have very little jurisdiction over that, especially when it comes to the PBMs. Uh, and we did pass a PBM bill this year, and it was a compromise bill uh, with the PBMs and, and the, the Hospital Association and who, all the parties that were involved. We'd like to see how that plays out. And then possibly, at least from my perspective, uh, on 5L, we, we're proposing we not do that today. Uh, uh, and my personal opinion is, and I've not talked with Representative Ken Cannon, is not to do hers and then let us come back next year and, and maybe have a, an agreement on adding both of them. Thank you for the question, Senator. That's my proposal. Senator Tyson. I had a question. Different topic. So. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask on the um, 6L, no, on 11L, the vote, um, if there was consideration when that uh, request was put in to also do a at least a sampling audit of the voter rolls. Um, I think uh, Senator Pyle is going to make a statement, so that'd probably be a good person to ask a question to. Um, so why don't we hold that until he speaks? Is there any other further question? Uh, I'm guessing what on your five L at least you want to hold that. We would like to put, put it on and not hold. do anything on the three forty B because we did pass the compromise bill. And that takes it off the list. And I know we have another, other really important issues that we need to be taken up. And I didn't want to yeah. uh, take any time for those. Further questions or comments? Not seeing any, we'll go ahead. And then uh, we have uh, Ron Hyland. If you want to get up and speak on 6L. And Lindsey Vaughn will be right after Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I would like to speak on behalf of our request to look at the GEMDs, the groundwater management districts. It boils down to a basic question. We want to determine how they are following the law which they were created under in the mid 70s, <clears throat> the GMD Act, of which they were charged with conserving. And we've looked at all of the data in the committee. We didn't have time to drill down on this. But within the committee, we found that the water tables have continued to decline throughout the years that they've been in management. So we want to take a close dive down and look at this, see how they're complying with the laws. And then that would help guide the legislature in any future decision and legislation they might find. Now, if changes are needed, that's fine. If not, we'll get our answers one way or the other. With that, I'll stand for questions. Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Representative, for bringing this to you, us and all of your work on water. It was extensive and impressive. And I think after what we heard today that the Department of Revenue not following the law, that this might be an ex exceptional audit for the state to, especially since it's been since the 70s. Thank you, Mr. Representative Chairman. Barker. Thank you. Uh, I'll just key in on what the senator indicated. You've done great work with water. Uh, Thank you. Thank the you. bill that you put together, unfortunately, we never got time to, to actually work that bill. But uh, all your research that you've shared with all the legislators have been very helpful. And it, and it scares me because at some point in time, uh, western Kansas, maybe central Kansas, we're going to just be out of water. And uh, I, I will support this uh, this. It. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions, um, Senator Corsican? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would I would just echo what um, the good senator and the representative said for the same reasons. I mean, I've, there was an article that came out while we've been on break about 
how water challenges can affect property values in central and western Kansas. So I, I just commend you for bringing this and Representative Vaughn as well. Uh, you both done tremendous work, and I think this is a critically important issue. And I think it's something that getting these answers can help us do a good job of policy making, which is, I think, one of the value adds of, of this committee is our ability to kind of get the information that can lead to good policy making. So I'm I'm also very supportive of this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Other questions, uh, Senator Ware. Just a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, being on the Ag Committee for five years now, water is important. I we can't live without it, right? It's one of the three main things we have to have to live. So it, I think it's critical that we look really carefully, and I'm very much in favor as well. Other questions? Not seeing any. Um, Thank you for your comments, and I can't leave without thanking Kristen for guidance and help in designing this audit. Thank you. Representative Vaughn, Lindsay Vaughn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my chair did a uh, fantastic job of describing the contents of the audit, so I won't speak too much on it. But in addition to really digging into our GMDs, addressing or carrying out their statutory purpose, you know, as we've investigated their work, we've also become concerned about their independent taxing authority and if they are responsible stewards of those taxes. And so I think that's a key part of this audit as well. Um, in addition to the fact that uh, these water rights that GMDs are supposed to be protecting are uh, property rights. And so as a state, it's our, our role to protect those property rights and to ensure the public and future interest of water in our state. Um, I think this is a huge issue for the future of our state as well. Recent demographic changes show that young people are moving back to western Kansas. And this is critical for their livelihoods, their ability to stay in rural towns, their families. Um, so it's really important for our state, and I uh, appreciate all of the, the friendly comments and support and um, appreciate your consideration. And thank you to Kristen for all of her great help. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Not saying any, but my comment to you, I spent about 24 and a half years on water board. Uh, definitely understand how important it is for drinking and the use of ag and, and other and recreational and how important I I was fishing uh, yesterday at Lake the Ozarks, so uh, it's five feet down right now. So I understand the value on the recreational side as well. Um, so this is probably the most important issue in the state. At, at my, Mr. Chairman, did you catch anything? Uh, I, uh. We caught a few, but that's a secret. Uh, Representative Burroughs, do you have a comment? Uh, no comment, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'd make a motion that we approve we're not in that phase yet, but we will soon be. We're going to take them individually? Well, I think we ought to listen to all the people here, and uh, then we'll go into working all them. Okay. Further comments? Not seeing any? Okay. Uh, we'll move on to uh, 11L, Senator Pyle. The audits are necessary. Thank you. Uh, is it Chris? Thank you. And so uh, that was sent to me. I received it yesterday. I was asked to present it. Uh, he had heard about our my request, and so we wanted to get something to back that up. And then I will pass out also. Oh, I thought he was just going to pass it around, but this is my testimony. So. As I said, good morning. I want to thank uh, Chris, audit team, Kristen, thank you. Uh, I appreciate their help in putting together the questions that were presented this morning. And uh, I want to thank you committee members for the time and the opportunity to be here and for uh, giving this consideration. For quite some time now, many people, including some of our own constituents, 
have been sharing their concerns and questions with their elected officials about the elections and activities surrounding election processes. This is not just a partisan concern. Following the 2016 elections, U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar and Senator Richard Blumenthal, both Democrats, were among the first to voice their concerns with election results. And again, that was back following the 2016 election. In order to address these concerns from my constituents and the people across Kansas that I've heard from, I have listened. Listened as some election issues have been heard and debated in the Senate and have followed as findings from other states have begun to surface. I've read some of these reports and found that indeed many opportunities exist for making our processes more transparent and accountable. It's also becoming more apparent that whether or not Kansas has issues, we should be taking further steps to ensure prevention of election fraud and abuse, to restore public faith in our elections. I believe this audit is one step that could bolster public confidence. There are some reasons for the audit request before you. Kansans need to know whether or not similar activities did or, and I emphasize could, take place. The audit proposal you are considering can provide guidance to preventing election fraud and abuse and could potentially answer many of our constituent questions, not to mention give direction on how to continue proceeding to make Kansas elections the most healthy, secure, and free in the nation. The audit addresses many questions, and I believe in a very efficient manner. Thanks to the audit team, um, I, I believe they have put this in a way that is the most efficient it can be. Asking these questions is a good starting place for addressing many concerns. Today is your day, committee, to choose to lead by enacting the will of the people by providing sunshine on our election process. I ask for you to please approve this audit. I thank you for your time and your consideration, and I will stand for questions. And I would like to add, though, I got this report back quite a ways in session, and it's the Wisconsin Office of Special Counsel. I think it's, I believe it's called the Gableman Report. It opens up a lot more questions than what I've got in this audit. Too many. And I think that if you look at the Arizona reports that have been conducted, the audits, and look at some of those, what it makes me consider is where are we going with our elections? And what are the processes? What are the concerns? I'm hearing it from the people on the ground that are reading these same things. And that's why this audit is before you, to make sure that in the future we prevent any potential problems. And we can learn from all of this if we're willing and move forward. And I hope that I can garner your support. Thank you. And now I'm ready for the questions. <laughs> I have not a question for the Senator, for Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, it looks like three staffs, seven months. Would that be correct? When we earlier, uh, Chris had mentioned that we were going to have to do six audits. That's about twice. As, this one would be twice as big as the normal audits, which are three months. Does that mean we would only have six or five if we do this? Okay, that that was my question. Thank you very much. Other Thanks, question, sir. Senator Burroughs or Representative Burroughs. I'm sorry. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Pyle, can you share with me on the letter that we received from uh, Mark Fincham the what issues were discovered? Do you know what they may have encountered? Because there, he did mention the prosecution, or it's been turned over to the Attorney General for prosecution. Is is there a, something that we might want to put into the scope statement? Is why I'm. I asking. would I would ask your representative Burroughs to contact. Representative Fincham. I have not talked directly to him. Again, I received the letter yesterday. He found out about my audit request and wanted to submit a letter in support. Um, but if you read, uh, there's so much online from their, their reports. This one, there are two reports from Wisconsin. One is a summary. It's a 25-page report. I have that one also in my office. This one's 130-some pages. It takes some time to read and digest. 
But as you go through what they're finding, it's not just some of the things that they found. I could, there are recommendations at the end of the report. Um, getting this down to five questions, uh, like I said, I commend the auditors because uh, they know I had lots of questions when I sat down with them. And um, it is, it's, there's a lot of other questions that I still have that we can't take because as uh, Representative Barker pointed out, this is a lengthy audit. Uh, but when we broke it down to, to divide it, it becomes more inefficient to complete it. If you break it into two audits, you get nine months. If you break it into several, you get even longer. To put it all together into one package makes it the most efficient way to address what we have in these questions. So, but again, I would, I would just direct you to go directly to the source and go to Representative Fincham for the answer to that, please. Thank you. Senator Corsison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple points. I, I think that for me, I, I think this is uh, obviously a lot of time went into putting this together. I'm, I'm a little bit, the point I would raise for the committee's consideration is really around the timing of when we do this. My view is that it would be more appropriate to do it in 2023 after so we could look at the 2022 elections and do it in a year where we don't have statewide elections. I worry about doing this now when we're still asking counties we don't yet have approved maps. The Supreme Court still has to approve those maps. So counties are still trying to finalize the new maps that they're having to work under. June 18th, they have to mail ballots for military and overseas voters. August 2nd, we have a primary, then we have a general election coming up in November. So I worry about taking staff time away from getting prepared for those elections uh, that are coming up. And I think then 2023, when we don't have statewide elections, it could be more fruitful. Plus, since 2020, we've implemented a number of changes in both 2021 and in 2022 in the legislature related to our elections. So I think we should be more fruitful to see how those have been implemented in 2022 than it would be to go back and look at 2020, which is coming up on two years old and was before some of these changes that we've enacted have been in place. So th that, that's kind of where, where I come down on this is, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a issue of importance and, but I, I'm just thinking that maybe we would find, for the reasons I outlined, 2023 would would be um, a better time to, to do this work. So would love to hear the good senator's response. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just comment this. How long are you going to kick a can down the road? You know, I've been hearing from people for two years. And, and people, and, and as I stated in my testimony, after the 2016 election, people were complaining. It's been longer. This should have been done a long time ago. Um, part of the process is, and I believe this audit can be completed so that we can take this up next January. Am I wrong on that, Kristen? When would the completion date be, do you know? Yes. but it could potentially be done by January. Is that wrong? Yeah. And so uh, as I, uh, to address your concerns, I think, you know, you can keep kicking the can down the road, but at some point it needs to be done and it should have been done in my opinion. These concerns have been shared for the last several years. Um, and, and it's not just looking back. Like I said, we're trying to look forward to make sure that things don't happen in the future. We don't want things to happen here. We want good secure. We want good uh, uh, elections with integrity. We want to be able, some of the questions that are asked of people to me are when is this going to happen? And so I think it begins, and I have full faith and confidence in all of my elected county officials in my district and across the state that they can conduct this and that they have the people on board to be able to do what is necessary to make sure our elections this year are completed. And I'm sure that they will prioritize things. Uh, I don't think this is too much to ask. I really don't. I think those are... Go ahead. All of them. Yeah, thank you. I just, just in response, I appreciate that. I just don't want to minimize the work that the legislature has already done. I mean, Mr. Chairman, I know that your committee has taken a, a serious and, and hard look at this and that 
you've devoted a lot of your committee's time to looking at this issue. So I, and I know that also represent Barker's committee has, has taken a serious amount of their committee time to look at this issue, which is of concern to, to all of us. So I don't think it's fair. I would have just object a little bit to the characterization that the legislature has been kicking the can down the road. I think Chairman Olson's committee, I think Chairman Barker's committee have taken a serious look at this, the legislature. I haven't agreed with, with all of the, the policies, but we have implemented a number of, of things to address concerns that folks have and the legislatures, whether I agreed with them or not, the legislature has decided to adopt those things. So I think we've had committees who are taking this issue seriously. We've had the legislature respond with legislation that has been adopted. So uh, that was just a little bit of a rejoinder to that. And Thank let me you. clarify, Mr. Chairman, kicking the can down the road is specifically meant to the auditing part of it. We have done a lot in the legislature. I believe it was Senator Tyson that brought it up and you took action on the uh, finding out what took place with what were called the Zuckerman money, the grant money. And a year ago, we addressed that and we limited them that they couldn't take the grant money. They couldn't take private money to administer elections. I think that was taken care of. That was a great thing to do in dealing with ballot boxes and other issues that we've seen this year. It's great. I'm not saying we're kicking the can down the road on everything. I'm saying specifically, we need this audit. We need to know so that we can go forward and proceed, and we need to restore the full confidence. We need people to believe that when they go to vote, that their vote is counting and it's being counted accurately. They don't, I mean, when you read these reports from these other areas that have happened, it, it's amazing what they're finding because they're conducting audits. And that's, that's why I'm here. It, this is, I consider this to be the people's audit. It's, Representing probes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The couple of things. I don't understand how an audit that won't be done before the election, looking two years back, helps ensure integrity in the next election or provides any level of security or faith. It does seem to me if we really have a genuine interest in addressing this and looking at this, we would not look two years back on an audit that won't be done until after November, we would say, let's look at what we've put in place. Let's look at what concerns we think may or may not be out there and then apply those forward looking and do that audit at a later time. It, it, and I, maybe you want to address this or not, but it seems like a pretty, it's going to be, a, in my view, a misuse of staff time and resources to put them to work on a seventh month, seven month long audit that will have no value to the next election. You got a comment? Uh, just a brief one. Um, I think you're misreading all of the audit because the audit is going in and looking at not only uh, stats and stuff. The other thing, the auditors can explain it probably better than me, but we're trying to figure out what processes are in place for handling the nursing home uh, part of it is what procedures are in place. How does that handled? You know, our ballots being collected is what's going on. It's about today and it's about tomorrow. And, and we want to make sure the audit gives us that. It will give us the answers or maybe it'll probably create more questions and you'll have to act further. Uh, you know, I, I think we simply I'm trying to address the concerns of the people out here on the ground that want this audit. And some of their concerns are in this. And some of them want to look back. Okay, so Kristen, can you tell how much of it is perspective and how much of it is not? I mean, can you simply state something on that? Please. Sure. Um, I mean, I can't say like in percentage terms or something, but obviously our, our plan would be state law today requires that counties do certain things. And so then we would go to them to say, what sort of what evidence can you provide us that you have done those things? So to the extent that that means going back in time to look at documentation that might still exist um, from that, that's what we would be doing um, where we're able to do that. Um, some of it's also just going to be, I mean, there's, depending on which question we're talking about, there's some survey work, there's you know, obviously interviews with folks, those, those would be things that are more present tense. 
Thank you. A quick follow-up. We've got like three more people after you, so. I guess I want to ask the question and raise the point too. It, there's several references in this audit proposal for like, they're not clearly defined in my opinion, but there's references to national best practices or federal best practices based on what we've seen nationally and state legislatures across the year while this audit's ongoing wouldn't we have a situation where the auditors are having to adjust to changing standards and practices based on the implementation of new legislation i'm not an auditor uh, when i read that about best practices i had questions also but I'm trusting these people to know what they're looking for. We gave them the information we want. They put it in the questions, and that's the language. So if you want to speak to that, that's fine. I'm, I'm, ha I'm content with it. You want to say something? Go ahead. I mean, that's not necessarily uncommon um, to work. So, I mean, obviously, we'll do our best to adjust to that as needed, basically. Senator Tyson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for bringing this to us. Um, I have several things. One, I adamantly disagree. I think this needs to be as soon as possible. And a look back is how you discover mistakes made. You always do a post-mortem. Um, so that's that's where you find where the holes are. You don't look to the future. Um, the other thing I do, I did bring up the comment about the voter rolls. I would like to see at least maybe a small sampling included of that pick one precinct or two precincts, if we could. Um, I would also ask that on the audit, if you don't have any problems with this, the uh, we talk about the procedures and the policies in place, but I have concern as to those policies may be in writing, but not being implemented. We heard great testimony on the Senate floor from Senator Hildebrand, a prime example when he was a county commissioner uh, you can have all the policies in place, but the numbers did not match and the election was still verified. And so I would ask that we also look at that, maybe even that specific county to that situation so that we can avoid that scenario in the future. Um, I know that's quite a bit, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I appreciate this. I When I was... Um, my first time I ever brought a request for an audit, I was not on the committee. The ranking minority leader came up to me afterwards and said he has never seen a post audit get voted on and moved to the front of the queue, except when I had brought that post audit. They found over $30 million with no oversight. I think this audit has that potential too, and I will be advocating for it to be moved to the front of the queue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Tyson. You know, it's it's just, I think, you know, I spent a lot of time on bank boards auditing, and I don't look at audits as a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. At the, the best case, everything's working right, and there's always a few recommendations that come out of them. You know, and don't say things don't slip through because we just seen one today that Senator Tyson caught from the uh, driver's license, you know, on on being um, suspended. And, you know, it happens. And so I, I believe if we do do this audit, there's going to be a lot of good things that we'll be able to work on in the future, hopefully together, to improve our election laws that will come out of this, things that are not working, or maybe things need to be taken off the books. Uh, we've got a couple in front of you. Um, uh, Senator Th uh, Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I fully agree with Senator Tyson, and, and thank you, Senator Pyle, for bringing this. I think this is of the utmost importance. Um, just within the last week or week and a half in my district, uh, after seeing what the legislature has done this year, uh, with regard to election integrity, we're still having groups meeting on election integrity because we don't operate in a bubble here in the state of Kansas. People watch national news. They hear what happened in Georgia, uh, Michigan, Arizona, places like that, and they are concerned. And the only way that we're going to restore the faith in our election integrity is by taking this step 
by looking at all these, and I think this is a good first step. Uh, there, there may be more coming that we need to look at, things like uh, connectivity to the Internet, embedded software within some of the machines that we know uh, is difficult to detect, and uh, perhaps that would be the next step in the audit that, you know, um, you, you need software engineers, uh, people who understand this sort of stuff to do it. So my comment is I, I think this um, should be a top priority. I think it should be done now uh, because we, we do have elections coming up and people are still concerned even after seeing what the legislature did this past year. Uh, so I fully support this and, and think it's top priority. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So when we had the unemployment insurance uh, crisis here in Kansas last year, we had a legislative post audit that started the process, but it was at one level. And then through the legislation we passed, there was a, a more of a forensics audit that happened after that, trying to, trying to trace down where did uh, the payments get placed, who paid to who, to what bank account, to what country. That's more detail. Would you consider, I'm getting comments from constituents and others that say, please approve this forensics audit. I don't think this is a forensics audit. I wanted your opinion on that. Um, I don't know. I, I would, I don't think it is. I don't believe it is. So. Okay. Um, so it's not a forensics audit, so it's not getting into all the legal framework for it, but it's more what I'm reading from it. There's a lot of policy and process and practices uh, that are going to be reviewed in this. So then my second question is just to follow up on Senator Tyson's, which was I 100% agree with on the implementation. I don't see anything in here on these items that includes the implementation. So I'm wondering, um, Senator Pyle, for example, on number two, do Kansas County election officials um, have adequate policies and procedures to ensure and, and include implementation, evidence of implementation. Would that be more in line with what you're trying to um, find out? Some of what I read in some of the reports from other states, the, and specifically in the counties where they took the grants, there were people put in and, and they basically took over. So the elected official, and these are under testimony in some of the, you can find it. They have, they have stated they felt like they were out of control. They were being told what to do. That should never happen. And so that's where the training part comes in. What do we have for training? Does an election official know their power and what they're supposed to be doing and the control that they have? I mean, those are questions. I mean, as I took this from people and I took the reports and I read and listened, I came up with all kinds of questions. I mean, if you want to go further, uh, that's up to this committee. Um, you could go a lot further in a lot of things. So, Christian wants to explain something. Okay. More, more detail. Um, I, this might be helpful, but if you look at the um, 11 all, like the full proposal under, so especially for objectives one and two, um, which is where I feel like a lot of these questions relate to. So if you look at, it's not in the bold, but the fourth bullet on objective one and the third bullet on objective two, that is speaking to us doing at least a little bit. So we're, we're not gonna be able to do this for every county, but like is typical for a lot of our work, we would look at a selection, some sort of sample and try to go in where documentation exists to look at whether or not, so this is what law requires, they do or don't have policies to align with that, and then we can see for a sample whether or not those things appear to have actually occurred. That's great. I think that obviously we don't want to just know if they have policies and procedures, but they're actually working. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did you want to make a follow-up? Okay. Or comment? Or comment. Yes. Comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the word forensic, forensic has been bantered around and basically it is, uh, the initial definition is use in a court of law. So absolutely this audit could be used in a court of law. If you go down to the science or technology portion of it, if we would, maybe if you would be receptive to it, I think add a little bit of language that allows them to look at the version numbers and uh, the software, the vendor, so that we can get that and um, research 
I mean, I, I did a research paper in 2006 on electronic voting machines, and it would scare all of you. You would absolutely want those machines removed. In Florida, they were using 8-bit machines, and once the voters reached a certain count, it reversed. It negatively subtract votes instead of adding them because it was only 8 bits. It only had so many numbers in the machine. So I think that level of detail is what we need. I don't think we can get it with this audit, but if we did have the uh, version number, the code, and, and specific information, as Senator Thompson said, so that software, and we can look at what other states, Texas has a very exclusive list of what can and can't be used for their voting machines. And I think Kansas needs to get to that level. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Barker. Go ahead. I just want to make sure I know where we're at here. So the audit's been proposed as is. I think the senator uh, to my right has offered a tweak, I think that's the term you use, to tweak. Uh, so it would change, this audit would. So I guess my question, Mr. Chairman, is if we approve this audit today without the tweak, then it is what it, how, how it's written. I know in the past, it's probably been eight or nine years ago, where we actually approved an audit. Chris, you may remember this. And then allowed the two parties, along with post-audit, to kind of do their little tweak and, and go forward if all the parties agree. And I don't know if the senator would want to do that or not. Uh, but if we approve it the way it is today, it's what it is today without a tweak. If the parties can work this out in a short period of time and, and do the tweak, we could approve it today, subject to the tweak. Uh, and I, Senator, would you be willing to work with the? I, I would be completely willing as long as you're adding to the audit to go further. See, I don't want to subtract. I don't have. I mean, there are a lot of things I could add to this audit. I would. I have no problem with adding a forensic sample. Uh, what she's talking about, what Senator Tyson is talking about. I don't have a problem with that if you want to add to it. I'm just supportive of the audit, and I'd like, I'd like to get it done today yeah. and not come back in another month when you've agreed to a different uh, adding to. Right. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Um, Representative Toplicker. Senator Pyle, um, <clears throat> would, you, would this audit include looking into the tabulators and whether or not results on tabulators could be changed? I, I believe that was one of the things we addressed. It's not specific. I, Kristen would know better, but I think that part of what we're trying to figure out is, I mean, I have a lot of questions, Representative. Number one, I wouldn't know what a modem looked like if you had it sitting right here. And I'm told it could have all kinds of appearances and all kinds of faces that a lot of people wouldn't know. Clerks wouldn't know. Elected officials wouldn't know. Uh, what is a tabulator? You know, does it have, is the room Wi-Fi capable? I mean, they found out a lot of election officials in some of these reports, they don't know. They didn't even know if they had Wi-Fi cap com in whatever the right terms are, compatibility or whatever. But I do believe, yes, the tabulators will be looked at in this office. Okay. So, the, the reason I ask is... Uh, I'm a member of the House Elections Committee, and we had all kinds of questions come up in there, and a lot of counties do totally different election processes than others. The rural counties, some of them still are, are paper. Um, <clears throat> and so, but I have researched this with the tabulators, and <clears throat> I've uh, read a lot um, and, and seen a lot out there and I have, and I don't believe everything, but I see things where tabulators can be changed. Uh, the vote totals on the tabulators can actually be changed. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I, I've seen, I've seen stuff out there like that. So, and I, and I might just comment, Mr. Chairman. I, I believe that we talked with the auditors. Is statutorily there's a requirement that all election officials report their equipment to the Secretary of State. And if I'm wrong on that, I'll gladly back up. But I think that's readily, that should be readily available um, through the Secretary of State that uh, every county election officer, is that right, Kristen? I believe that statutory, did we look at that? 
I think that is something that they report, at least, I don't know in how much detail, but at least like what the manufacturer is of the voting machines the county is using is something they have. So we could get that, we could show, we want to find out the information, how many different kinds of machines are being. And that's why you refer back to the statements made by Texas that they have actually come in and said, these are the only ones. And, I, and I, those are the policies looking forward that we can come from answers from this audit and come back here hopefully sometime next session and say, this is, this is what we're going to do. And then we get the public hearing. We get everything we can hear from Secretary of State. We hear on the policy decisions like we've been doing. But look, like I said, this is the people's audit. I'm trying to answer uh, to my people in my district that want this. And it, does it go as far as some of them want? No. Is it a big audit? Yes. Is it going to be a heavy lift? Yeah. Okay, I think oh. we've got a pretty good fair assessment of what the audit is. Um, we've got one other House member, uh, Tori Umberger, Representative Umberger, and that's on ADEL, right? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's a tough one to follow. <laughs> um, my audit is pretty simple, and it's just going through. And the reason behind where I got this idea behind it is um, – with COVID, if you want to call it a blessing in disguise on, we've had to really utilize technology. And I think a lot of the jobs, you know, a lot of uh, the um, state work, agency work has been done online at home. And uh, you'll see at the very beginning of my audit, it talks about the background on uh, work personnel. Um, some folks are saying that they're actually getting more work done from working from home. So with that being said, you'll notice that there's help, help wanted signs everywhere. So how about we see, can some of these jobs be fully remote and let's stop recruiting from just the Topeka area. Let's start recruiting in Western Kansas. Let's start recruiting in Wichita, so forth. Um, and then the flip side on that as well is maybe we don't need as many state agency office space and maybe we can shrink that way too. So that's the two question twofold to my audit and I will stand for any questions. We have any questions? No, I think they got exhausted before. I am okay with that. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next step is we will take the motion um, after we get uh, enough audits. Then we'll come back and decide which order the which order they'll be in. So let's go ahead and start. And Representative Burrells, you were the first up. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, rarely do we get a bipartisan support on an issue that is significant as water. And I do want to commend both conferees today. And it is an issue that it does not only reflect bipartisanship, but it, it is a, a, a statewide issue, one of, that needs to be addressed. So I would move that we support 6L. Okay, do we have a second? Uh, Representative Barker seconds. Questions or comments? Okay, all in, do you have a, uh, no questions? Then we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against nay, okay. Six L's passed. And let's see, that's a four month audit. How many people? My, mine's got a hole right there. Where okay. Three, okay. Um, the next is uh, Representative Toplicker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would recommend uh, Senator Pyle's um, uh, audit, proposed audit 11L, and uh, the reason why is in my research that I have done after the 2016 uh, election and hearing from both parties from 2016 till now, uh, there are enough questions out there about election equipment, election procedure that I think we need to get more eyes. The more eyes, the better on the systems. So I would move that 11 uh, I would uh, add a caveat to that, that Senator Tyson and the Senator will be given, say, 10 days to tweak it to be approved by the chair. We approve it subject to that. I, 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 I think Senator Tyson brings something to, the, to the, the audit. I think the senator would agree, as he 
would add to, not subtract from. I think the senator would agree to that. Uh, so with that caveat, but you have to have a period of time that they can get this worked out and to be approved by you, Mr. Chairman. If, if, the, if the maker of that motion would agree to that. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Barker. Um, I will add that as an amendment to the motion. Then I will second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Questions or comments? Senator, or Representative Burroughs, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I did want to bring to the attention, I know the body has that, a letter from the Secretary of State in reference to, I believe it may be to this, in reference to this audit. I just wanted to make sure that everyone had a chance to review and read it. Yeah, I, I seen the letter from Secretary of State. I think everybody got it. Uh, and so, uh, Representative Toplicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I did look at the letter and uh, I went through it in detail and I did not see, uh, even though the Secretary of State um, <clears throat> knew that we were considering this and that's what he refers to in the letter, uh, but he did not specifically say that he was, uh, it doesn't look like I could find anything in here that said that he was opposed to the audit. So um, just wanted to point that out. Representative Barker? Oh, I have another motion to make on a, are we ready to move along? Well, let's vote on this. Okay, one. Uh, okay I'll wait till we vote. Hey, okay, we're kind of on some comments here. Do we have any further comments on this motion? Okay. Um, the motion is to pass 11L and uh, to give uh, Five days for Senator Tyson, Senator Piles. No, oh, she wanted to narrow it to five. Yeah. And I will then approve it. Uh, that approval will be sent out to everybody, too. Um, and that's the motion. And Topliker made you second. Any, okay. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Against nay? No. Okay. It passes. Does the nays want to be recorded? Not seeing anybody want to be recorded. Did you want to be recorded? Senator Ware wants to be recorded. Any others want to be recorded? Not seeing any. Okay. We'll move on. So is that considered we're like three now Two. audits or yeah. I'll let you I'll let you know. Okay. Uh Representative Barker. Thank you. Uh I've talked with uh representative on the committee about four L. I do note that the chairman did not let her talk about her uh, audit that she has proposed, but I think it's a great audit, and I will make a motion to uh, pass out 4L. Uh, okay, uh, Representative Toplicker seconds. Is there any questions or comments? You want to make some? Uh, Representative Williams. Well, thank you for offering it. And I do think it's, we want to help Kansas kids first and have more kids that play sports here and do activities here in Kansas. And just to look at it would be helpful to those 19 community colleges and to all of our regions that feed off of those. So thank you very much. Okay. Other questions or comments? Not seeing any. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Against nay. Passes. Okay. Um, it's the next one. Mr. Chair. Representative Barker. I just got a question for the post auditor, Chris. Go ahead. Uh, they have uh, 1E, 2E, 3E, 9E, and 10E that are staff proposals. If you were to pri uh, <laughs> put them by priority, what would be the most important? I mean, normally in our past, we've always tried to approve at least one staff uh, audit and uh, uh. Representative Burroughs. Thank you, and and I want to follow up my colleague's comment. That's exactly what we've done in the past. But so one thing that I think we might want to look at is the return on the amount of dollars that we may be missing in not doing some of these audits. In the past, we've had a dollar figure that may have been. Uh, projected as a savings or efficiency or some kind of uh, uh, elimination of duplication. 
So I think that's uh, very important that we look at staff. Staff brings these forward. They're mandated to do so. So I, I would agree with the, with the chairman. So I like that prioritization. We got everybody's. Okay, good. Uh, okay. I would make a motion to to uh, pass out one e. One e. Okay. If they have it as one, I think that's a priority. Representative uh, Toplicker seconds. Um, questions or comments about one uh, e? Not seeing any. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Against nay. Passes. Next up is Chris, or Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to make a motion to approve 8L, assessing the impact of permanent work from home options. 8L. Do we have a second? I have a second. Mr. Chair. Okay, Representative Barker. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to clarify, since we did vote on 11L and they say it's going to take up two, does that mean we only get five instead of six? Yeah. So this one is the last one. So I have concern over that, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, well, we do have a motion in a second, but okay, you want to go ahead motion. and state your concerns. I do. Um, and, you know, I've got concerns too because the one – um, that I don't want to forget about is 13L. That's the one I was going to bring up, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So if we're on discussion on the motion, I'll proceed. Uh, go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Mr. Tyson. And Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I appreciate uh, Representative Armberger bringing this to us. Um, I know that there are policies and procedures that uh, the federal government, she may not be aware of, have in place permanent uh, work from home, I think we could look to those examples and do some legislative research to get numbers and information that she's looking for. However, on 13L, I do know, and I have looked at this for a while, there are inefficiencies in the money getting to um, individuals with child support. We are charging, a vendor is charging us um, a pretty hefty amount, and we could do that with other technology with bank transfers for under a dollar and, and save the individuals that are needing the child care money and get that into their pockets. That's what the attempt of the program is. So I do think this audit is needed in 13L. I appreciate the other, but... This what I would say, too, is if we could bring 8L back, maybe it's a 100-hour audit. Um, May I? Go ahead. Uh, I, I looked at that, and I like 13L, too, because I used to do child support uh, when I was on the bench. Uh, but I, 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 we picked out 1E. 1E, the audit, only has one staff, and it only takes two months. So I think, uh, and we'll ask Chris, I think she can do both 13L and 8L. And I'll ask her that question, but that's because I'm right. Okay. So I think we have room for both. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if it was going to not be feasible, I think that it could be broken down to one question if need be, if you can't get two questions and make it a shorter audit. But I think the goal should be to try to accomplish it and also get to the other important audit that was mentioned by Senator. We can do, well, my understanding, we can do both. Okay, it sounds like we can do both. So are, is there any further questions on ADEL? We have a motion and a second. Uh, is the motion to do the com combined um, 
8 L and 13. We're going to do one motion at a time. Okay. We'll come back. All right. I just want to make sure what I was voting on. Okay. We're only voting on 8 L. We have a motion and a second. Is there any questions or comments? Not seeing any. We'll go ahead and vote. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Against nay, it passes. 8 L is on the books. And uh, then we have a motion. Do we have a Senator, Senator Tyson? Okay, we have Senator Tyson makes the motion on 13 nail. Do we have a second? We're going to say Representative Burrell second. Go ahead. Representative Burrell second. Okay, do we have any questions or comments? I have my only comments is I used to do this. Uh, uh, when I was on the bench, Senator is correct. We do a very poor job of going on child support, and especially from out of state, 4D cases. Uh, so I, you know, this I will, I'm anxious to look at the outcome of this audit when it gets done. I've seen other states and how they do better. Yeah. Kansas has been poor for a long time. this system so we do have a motion in a second any comments or questions not saying any all in favor please signify by saying aye. aye against nay it passes okay now we get to figure out what order we want to do them in top two or so um so um we've passed let's see 13 l 8L, 1E, 4L, 11L, and 6L. So uh, looking at the schedule, which ones uh, would we like to start with? Uh, seeing Senator Thompson. Go ahead. Thank, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would uh, move that we um, do 11L and 6L first. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, any comments on that? Not seeing any. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Against nay. Okay, them are the uh, ones we'll start with. Uh, do you want the, the next bundle, maybe the next two? Or are you? Okay. Okay. Uh, Senator Top or Representative Top Licker, I'm sorry, I'll get it right one of these days. I'm kind of interested in 10E evaluating. Sort of filled the bucket already. I know, but uh, for a hundred hour audit, possibly. Uh, I don't know how much leeway you have there, but at some time, maybe an audit would go faster than we expect, and and if you could work that in somehow, um, I mean. It, I, it's suggested by staff, and, and I know that I have thought about that for a long time. It drives up the cost of uh, college education. Let's see where we can go from there. Uh, Representative Williams? And, and you can submit those individual audits, and then they go through and get approved by our chairman. But I would also note that KBOR has that data, and we looked at it at appropriation. And amazingly, they've done, those student sentence have done a good job of not raising the fees much in Kansas. Some schools, none in the last few years. So anyway, that data is available by KBOR, and we could probably get that to you with even out an audit. Tyson? Mr. Chairman, if we're looking at 100-hour audits, I, it looks to me like 3E could be less than 100 hours and very important um, considering the security of the... We yeah. will take a look at that. Representative Barker? I just want to make a comment to the committee. I know uh, Representative Burroughs has been on this committee since I was a young child. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think I've been, I've been on it for 10 years. And every year we get bills from different committees requiring audits. Remember, every time you vote for one of those and those passes, that gives us less options uh, to pick audits. We used to be able to pick more audits. But over the years, uh, whatever committee it was, 
said, well, you know, we're going to add this post audit requirement in there. Well, that takes away the authority of this committee. So I, I would recommend when you see those type of bills, you go back to the sponsor and say, we, we, you can bring it to the post audit committee. And if it has merit, we'll approve it. But don't put it in legislation. Because once it's in legislation, it's there forever. And, you know, we, we used to be able to pick a lot more audits. Uh, and it's unfortunate that, you know, we only had six today. But, uh, and there were some other good audits that probably needed to be approved. But every time you, they put them in a statute or in a bill, then it takes, uh, it takes uh, the choices away from this committee. So I just want to make that comment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, when you see those type of bills that put a post audit in there, just remember, that's one less audit that we get to vote on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Representative Burrell, do you have something? Uh, I agree 100%, and I really appreciate my good friend bringing that forward. <clears throat> I would just also advise that the, um, the strain that we put on staff, because we'll have some new audits next time that may be important, and some of these audits may very well get bumped. So, uh, and I appreciate uh, my good friend bringing that up. The, the bipartisan comment I made early on about the one audit on water I think is very important because we as a post audit have an obligation when we go on the floor and we hear the discussions that are occurring on bills to re reference back to some of the audits that have already been conducted on some of the subject, subject matter that is being discussed in, uh, on, in the chambers. And I know I try to do that as much as I possibly can, but as members of this post audit team, we should all be encouraging our members to go in and look at these audits. And as I stated earlier, I think uh, Chris found the one that was on the um, child support, and, but this was 2001, and I've been here quite, quite a while uh, to remember some of these, but I go back and review those audits to communicate to my colleagues, and we want legislators to bring forward audits but also be mindful that they shouldn't be so partisan and so divisive. They should be one that helps us be more streamlined, more efficient, more respectful of the process. And I grow concerned, having been on the committee a long time, that some direction some of these audits have gone. But uh, we're all here to do a job, and I, I really appreciate the comments that my good friend made because it's ultimately we get these reports, and some people don't like the results of the reports. Then it becomes partisan and gamesmanship. Let's not do that to staff. Our staff has won national awards for years for the work that they do. And we should be mindful of that. Okay. Um, let's see, what's, okay, Chris, uh, ask you about our next meeting date. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I put a loose piece of paper at each of your places. It looks like this. It's just a quick update of uh, what's coming up. Uh, we do not have a next meeting date uh, specifically scheduled. It will probably be probably June, um, but I just wanted to go through this real quick. So today we covered everything there. What's coming up for you at a future meeting? Uh, we have four performance audits that are currently underway. That is looking at IT security services, uh, the CARES Act funding, a limited scope on cryptocurrency, and a limited scope on broadband. We have two IT security audits. The next two coming up are the Attorney General and Department of Labor. And then to Representative Barker's point, we do have some statutorily required audits uh, that we will be bringing before you because we need you guys to approve the uh, scope of our work. Uh, we have one on uh, K through 12 at risk, one on K through 12 uh, calling for a cost study. And then the uh, economic development team is a statutorily required uh, project that we have a dedicated team to on a three-year cycle. So those, that's what's coming up. I will set a date with the chair, and we will inform you all. We'll keep in mind we have CSG, I believe, in June, Wichita, so we'll make sure it's not that week. Okay, with that, we're adjourned.